Okay. <laughs> oh man, the lighting is so yellow. All right. Welcome everybody. Uh, that was an incredible amount of OBS setup. Uh, it's my first time using it. So, what are we going to be doing here today? So, as you can see, maybe down there, um, we're going to go ahead and take the video that uh, it's from Brett Weinstein's channel. Um, he, it's not one of the Dark Horse numbered podcasts. It's just called Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein, Fundamental Truth and How to Think About It. Um, and I'm going to have the description, or I'm going to have a link to it in the description below. But uh, they talk about a lot of stuff in that video, if you have seen it before. Um, and what I did was I went through and I took out, they talk a lot about Eric's geometric unity stuff. And, but they talk about a lot of things that aren't that either. So what I did was I went through and I chopped it up and condensed it down so it's just the stuff about geometric unity and a lot of the uh, metaphors and examples and sort of like hopefully you grok it because this type examples that Eric uses. Um, and so I've been through this video like three times um, back when it was just like watched the whole interview like twice and, uh, and I, there was a surprising amount of like Ugh, I'm trying to get it and I think I do but I don't know and then um, and then I came back to it, and then now what I've done since I edited it, I've watched the condensed edited version quite a few times. At least, I don't know, one and a half. Um, and then I've heard the beginning like a million times trying to set up this little quasi live stream. This isn't going out live, but I'm using OBS to like record it all. Um, and so what I think would be useful for my own thinking, and if this is of any use to anyone else, it's kind of why I'm recording it, um, is I'm going to go through the condensed version of him talking about geometric unity, and and then stop and sort of think out loud about what it is that he's trying to convey and any of the stuff that Brett's talking about and how my understanding parallels or is it cross purposes with his and draw because I feel like that helps me because he's, he's talking about a lot of spatial stuff and I'm not going to get all of this. Um, I, sh I should have looked up a few things before I did this, but this is sort of the thinking out loud video um, and I'm hoping I'm going to get more insight into my own understanding of what this is and, and how it works and, and what he's trying to convey. And then if I get a more refined, refined version, I'm thinking I'll do sort of a more streamlined video that's either me talking or maybe one of those whiteboard videos or something with, I don't know about diagrams, but like, you know, drawings if it's helpful and stuff. So we're gonna go through the video piece by piece. And, um, and yeah. So saddle up. I have no, no idea how long this is going to take. Um, so let's get going. Hopefully all of the audio sources are functioning. But let's go. This is a condensed version of that video. Again, what did he call it? Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein. Come on, man. My YouTube on my phone is being a jerk. Fundamental truth and how to think about it a.k.a. condensed down to just geometric unity and all of Eric's attempts to explain it to Brett in this discussion. So let's start. I'll be drawing. Not over there. It's not mirrored. Over there. <laughs> for the moment, I think the thing that is most pressing is for me to try to do for you what you did for me on your podcast. And the problem is I'm not equipped to do the job. Your primary area of interest, your focus is in higher math, which at some point essentially becomes indistinguishable from or so intermingled with physics that they are um, proceeding in tandem. Is that fair? That they are the same subject? How would you say it? It's a, it's a, it's a great question. I would say that there's a, an expression that the map is not the territory. And theoretical physics in its foundational subset, that is the, the discovery of what reality is at its deepest level, deepest physical level, is the one place where we think that perhaps the map is the territory, right? So in other words, it's like being handed Greenland as a map of Greenland. So I've heard you say this, and it has a... <laughs> Eric's face where he like, he can tell that it's not quite landing with Brett, but like it also... He's kind of tickled by the fact that he's probably said this before, and it also doesn't quite work for people because it's hard to get your head around 
I want to hear what Brett said, though. It has almost an emotional meaning to me, but I cannot make it work analytically. I can't understand what you're trying to tell me. And so I, I more or less think the way to do what needs to be done with respect to your work and what's probably going to end up being your greatest contribution, the way to do it is for me to reveal what I don't get and have you try to fill me in. And just by being courageous about looking stupid, maybe we can get to a place where a lot of people will suddenly have access to what it is you're saying where normally very few well, do. Well, first of all, I find the dark, the dark horse to be a really interesting... Okay, hold on. He's going to say, like, the, the show's cool and I want to be part of it. Um, so what if at the fundamental physics level, the map and the territory are the same thing? And so, again, this is just me thinking out loud. What's his name? The, oh, man, I'm not going to get it. He's a physicist, but he's been talking about, like, um, off like evolutionary theory ideas, there's almost no chance that what we see and perceive as reality is actual reality, right? Because um, the the creature the creatures in an evolutionary game theory type space who sort of created symbol sets around fitness would have been at disproportionately ad advantaged, and they would have like taken over the space. It's either David or Daniel. Ah, give me one second. I bet you it's in my. It's in my history, but that's going to be so, so long ago. And by that, I mean <laughs> weeks, months, maybe. Oh, he was all over the place a second ago. I can always edit this video down later. <laughs> or if you're listening at this uh, at 2x like I do routinely, then it won't go by. It won't take that long to, to go by. I'm gonna know him as soon as I see his face. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, this is the thinking out loud part. Oh my goodness. I'm on YouTube a lot. Shoot, now I think I must have passed it. Maybe this will be amazing when I do get it. <laughs> ah, come on. It can't be that long ago, really. I don't want to, my computer setup is very, well, I feel like it's very fragile right now, so I don't want to like mess with it looking up who this guy is on my computer. Because I'm worried about how much that mess with it might mess with OBS. Oh my goodness! Um. Okay. Let me let me give it one shot. Um. If I just scroll down. Nope. All right. And Daniel physics. I forget what his argument is. It's like, specifically, it's like, it's not VR. All right, well, I, I'm going to take a shot at trying to explain what it is. So, basically, his idea, and I'll put his name in the, in the description box below once I figure out who it is. He is essentially talking about reality itself is constructed when you, I don't know that he would delineate it quite like this, but like once it's observed. So that like, you know, in a video game, if the world is rendered when your character looks in a particular vector or area of the land, you know, like you're in Skyrim and you're looking off at the mountains to the left, I think that's going to show up as your right, but whatever, at one direction. And then, and so the question of where do the mountains over here exist? And he's like, ooh, just like a video game, they don't really, not in the same way that these mountains you can see right now exist. They don't exist until you look over there. And that his argument is that in that sense, it's very much like a human beings interfacing with reality is very much like we're wearing a VR headset and whatever direction we're looking in, that's where it's like created in the moment. And then it's created in every moment when everyone looks in any particular direction. And I'm assuming look 
also goes to or speaks to any sense modality and stuff any observation modality but so this connected to what eric's saying with like what if the map and the territory are the same thing and it's like i think i'm putting words in his mouth right but i think what he's describing in a way in, in like a one-off sentence and then they move on is kind of in a sen the same sense of that vr headset idea like what if physics slash math at the at the base level that uh, eric's trying to describe things at that what if that ground level understanding of reality itself is not only a model and a map a metaphor at a level of what's going on with reality but it literally is reality because reality itself is like a algorithm running the simulation not necessarily the simulation theory but maybe like you know like it's the 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 machine code behind what the vr headset is feeding you and you're experiencing it as like light and temperature and sensation of touch and sound and stuff but really it's what what if the physics and the math are explaining literally the machine code running that the thing that we perceive experientially and subjectively as sound temperature light touch etc like i think that's what he means by what if the map and the territory are the same thing like at a certain level it's not a map it's describing literally the machine code the source code is how eric talks about it a lot the source code of what we experience as day-to-day -day life and responsible for the whole kit and caboodle so i think that's what he's after when he's saying the map and the territory what if they're the same thing at base level so let's keep going interesting podcast and so to the extent that it uh that you are pioneering some new thing i'm willing to guinea pig it all right so when you say the map is the territory i mean i was just based on our nature i was thinking about a joke as you were describing the map being the territory about you know welcome to the map or something along those lines so what does it mean and in a sense that would have been a kind of quasi accurate read of the assertion right like brett's i think brett's joke is like aha well then welcome to the map as he points around him to like the plants behind him and the chair he's sitting in and the air they're breathing and stuff like morpheus in the matrix like this is the map like he doesn't say that in the movie but like he could have right that's the joke um uh, and i think if i'm understanding eric correctly that that would have made sense yeah like this experiential reality system game machine simulation uh, physics is the map at least the kind of map that he's talking about the kind of map that you know if geometric unity is is the thing um then that's the map or you know whatever ends up being true like what if that's the case the base fundamentals is the simulation it's just like the source code the machine code so pointing around you to like welcome to the map would have been yeah like you are living in the map that the map is the territory is the idea that um when you so that we tell ourselves map like stories in every discipline all the time and sometimes those maps are so good for our purposes that we think we're talking about reality but it's always models and are you telling me that in math somehow as we actually discover what's true you converge on reality is that your point we this is interesting i forgot that he said this it depends on what he means by converge there. But it's kind of like, because what I take at first blush is that he means that the, the map, the model, is like closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to, like if this is reality and this is the map or model that, ex that describes reality in human understandable ways, that like they, they ooh, closer, 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 so that they lay on top of each other. The map lays so completely and accurately over the territory that, you could mistake one for the other but i think but that implies two things right the reality and the map and then they get so exacting that it's like a, a map of san diego that's got every street light every human every building every electrical wire and every building wall and every sewer line and every grain of detail on a sidewalk it's so one-to-one -one that they're the same but then that still at a level implies that there's one layered on top of the other and I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think, 
I think, I mean, he presented it as a question, if I recall five seconds ago accurately, that Eric was like, what if it's not a one-to-one -one model of what's happening? What if it is actually what's happening? But we'll see. We'll see what Eric says. I don't remember what he says next. <laughs> we don't know whether when Albert Einstein said, let uh, X be a four-dimensional manifold with a 3-1 metric, and we will call it space-time. We don't know whether in some sense that weird sentence before the word space- Hold on. I'm going to write that down. A four-dimensional manifold. Let's go back a little farther. True. You converge on reality. Is that your point? We don't know whether when Albert Einstein said, let uh, X be a four-dimensional manifold with a 3-1 metric, and we will call it space-time. Oh, man, it's hard to write on here. We don't, we don't whether when Albert Einstein said, let uh, X be a four-dimensional manifold with a 3-1 metric, and we will call it space-time. With a 3, I don't know how you would write this, 1. Ah! Oh. And that is all space-time. We don't know whether in some sense that weird sentence before the word space-time. So this, the let x equal the four-dimensional manifold with a 3-1 metric, aka space-time, those details. Is an actual description of what space-time is? So is space-time actually a four-dimensional manifold with a 3-1 metric? Or? Or whether or not it is a model of what space-time is or if that is a model and a metaphor at a base level. So, okay. go ahead. Yeah, so the, the problem here is that when Magritte, for example, paints this famous painting that says, ceci n'est pas un pipe, this is not a pipe, he's literally correct because it's a picture of a pipe. Yeah, and if you haven't seen this uh, painting, it is just a classy looking pipe he says under here, this is not a pipe. And then it's, it's kind of getting the audience dynamically involved, right? It's like, imagine this painting is hanging up in a gallery and it's like, this is not a pipe. And if you, it's pointing at the, the levels of reality engagement, right? Like if you're standing in a gallery looking at the painting, correct, it's a painting. It was acrylic on canvas. Nothing you put on that canvas is actually a pipe. It is a representation of a pipe. It is something that looks very much photoreal as a pipe, but it's it's only a pipe if you erase yourself standing in a gallery in a 3D space interacting with what appears to be happening on a 2D plane. You know, if you if you delete that, which we do routinely, right? When we look at a television set or a monitor or a painting, like if somebody on a canvas paints a picnic scene at a park and a bunch of people sitting on grass by some water, then there is a way of engaging with that that's like, oh yes, these people are on the grass near water having a picnic. But at a very real sense, that is a kind of illusion that interacts with our sense modalities to give the appearance that these people are doing that. It's almost as if we're looking through a kind of fabricated window into an environment where they're having a picnic and they're, they're eating whatever by the water. But it's only by kind of, you know, the suspension of disbelief, just like when we're sitting in a movie theater. It's light on a screen bouncing into our eyeballs, but we kind of let go of that part and let ourselves be, you know, immersed in the experience of kind of what if it was real. So he's talking about it in the representation of this pipe. You know, people talk about this in spiritual circles all the time. They use the movie theater metaphor a lot, I feel like, in a lot of spaces where it's like it's light going from a projector onto a wall, basically, and into your eyeballs. But we act like these are humans with experiences and feelings and, you know, never mind the, the, the metaphor gets complicated and complexified by the fact that, like, you know, the music is, 
kind of uh, engaging with your senses in a way that like normal day-to-day -day reality there isn't typically music kind of subtextually indicating how you should feel right now um, we, we're also it's com complexified by the fact that like you know the people on the screen are real people photographed by an actual camera unless it's CG but let's leave that aside for right now um, but their emotional experiences and their actions and everything else has been um, constructed creatively it's been written and then rehearsed and then performed which is a different layer or type of reality than like if a real hidden camera crew was following someone around in their life so but that's what this painting is about it's like at one level it's it is a pipe if you're engaging with the painting it's like what is like the implied subtext or the implied part behind like if you were somebody to say what is this then if you're the implied subtext is what is in this painting without having to say in this painting all the time then you would say it's a pipe but if you're engaging with the full metatextual environment including yourself standing in a gallery looking at a painting which is acrylic colors on a canvas then it's like well it's not really a pipe and that's sort of that that engagement of ideas is a lot of what that painting's about it's like this is not a pipe because it is in the picture form symbol set wise but it's also not in the sort of larger reality which i think is very much in tune with the kind of dichotomy he's going to try and set up here with like the um three one metric right the space time of the world we know and the 14 dimensional manifold that he's going to say later that's like sort of undergirding everything and then like 4d space time is is somehow kind of like a slice of it that's a metaphor not not i don't know that it's i don't i don't think he ever uses slice but we'll see okay so yes the painting it is a pipe but it's also not a pipe simultaneously not a pipe mm -hmm. smoking pipe yep well in some sense we don't know whether albert einstein painted a picture of space-time which he called a a manifold with a three one metric or one three metric or whether or not he actually described what there was at base level and there was nothing left to find. So, so the reason he's using this, this is not a pipe metaphor, is like, did Einstein paint a picture of a pipe? Or did he very literally describe the source code under mechanics of a pipe? So I guess it comes back to, yeah, is it a model or is it the exact same as the thing? Did he literally write down the machine code of the world? Or did he write a really good model representation of the world? So for example, if we came to understand that um, what he called space-time was made up of tiny granular bits, and that there was a, a resolution and a granularity to space-time, then it wouldn't be a continuous, be beautiful, expanse. It wouldn't be a continuum. Mm -hmm. So if I, um, we don't know the answer to the question about whether or not at, at the bottom of theoretical physics is a collection of mathematical concepts or whether they're a collection of mathematical models. And the concepts are reality or the concepts model reality. Okay. It feels almost like he, he subbed in a third possibility like there's fundamental reality there's models of reality and then there's sort of like concepts that model reality okay i don't it doesn't really matter it's basically the same argument again in a different way which is what this video is about essentially right like presenting things over and over again in different ways to see if we can triangulate the truth here or the thing eric's trying to convey so again he's sort of just stating are the fundamental maths at the base of physics, are they modeling reality? Are they a small representation of uh, like symbols of what reality is? You know, like like building a model, like when Doc Brown builds a model of Hill Valley to practice what they're going to do to hit the lightning bolt by the courthouse, or are the, is the math and are the physics ideas concepts? I guess are those literally the firmament of reality itself so it's it's kind of a, a a difference between creating a toy 
that's very useful and gives explanatory power and understanding and things, but it's, it's not the same as the thing, or is it literally the thing in a fundamental, it's, it's kind of like if Mario in Mario, in, in Super Mario World, if he could sit down and figure out, like literally replicate the executable source code of the game cartridge, then he has not built a model, he's literally understood at base level the entire fabric of his world as experienced. He's seen past the, uh, the illusion of the surface to the source code and literally been able to put it in terms that he can understand, right? Math, let's say, equations and stuff, but, but it isn't a model of how his world operates. It's literally the source code of how his world operates. So it does, it, it does both. It gives him simultaneous like explanatory power and understanding, but it also, so it, it gives things that a model typically would, but it's not just a model. Okay, now I'm gonna play the role of the smart graduate student trying to get the professor's attention by saying things that are shockingly clever. I don't know if I'm gonna pull it off. I wanna say two things. One, we have a problem with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which is that we don't know if it describes actual uncertainty or uncertainty at the level that one measures. It is not real. In other words, we could have a completely deterministic universe in which inside of the universe we cannot um, nail down all parameters simultaneously and therefore we get the appearance of uncertainty. Is this a case where we do not know if Heisenberg has presented us the map or the territory? Good, good question. So. In the late 1970s, there was, a re there was a revolution, or maybe the mid-1970s even, that we don't talk about called geometric quantization. So you can look up, it has their book. Geometric quantization. Looks on geometric quantization. And one of the ideas inside of geometric quantization is that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle originates from the fact that a structure that we had known previously from the 1800s called Hamiltonian mechanics was actually a curved geometric system. I forgot about this part. This part is going to be rough. It's, it's a point worth, worth going over, though. Let's go back a little bit. And one of the ideas inside of geometric quantization is that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle originates from the fact that a structure that we had known previously from the 1800s called Hamiltonian mechanics. Hamiltonian mechanics from the 1800s. was actually a curved geometric system where the curvature of the system results in paradoxes because you're sort of, you had a flat earth style. So before we move on to the flat earth thing that he's about to say, Hamiltonian mechanics contained paradoxes that were later explained as not paradoxes if you realize that it's curved. Um, solved by understanding uh, it's, it is curved. Sorry for my handwriting. It's ridiculous. It's hard to write. I don't want to move the surface. It'll get off this screen. So, so okay. So from the eight, or in the eighteen hundreds, there was a whole chunk of physics, math. I don't know both Hamiltonian mechanics that had all these uh, unresolved paradoxes, and I'm assuming people sat around going like, "What's going on? This doesn't make any sense." And then it sounds like in the nineteen seventies, they figured out, "Oh, those aren't paradoxes." They are, they completely make coherent sense if you understand that the fundamental structure was curved. 
all of a sudden the paradox is just whoosh, dissolved. And so it was that lack of understanding of the fundamental firmament of the situation, the context, the fundamental context of where these paradoxes were propping up, uh, propping up, uh, popping up. There we go. That that resolved it. And Eric's saying right now that Heisenberg's uncertainty comes from Hamiltonian mechanics, I think. Expectation, and then when you encountered curvature, like the triangle with 90 degrees on every angle. Now that's not supposed to happen, that you can have a triangle that's 90, 90, 90, but you can on the surface of a sphere. If you bent a triangle around a sphere. Or if you call it a curved linear triangle on a sphere and you're talking about spherical geometry, it's a legit. Right, so this is usually not, you, you shouldn't be able to get 90. But if you're on a sphere, then you could end up with angles that would give you 90, 90, 90. Ta-da! Legitimate triangle, not just a bent one. So in other words, implicitly, you're in I think what he means there is that like, it's not like a deformed triangle. I mean, it kind of is and it isn't, but he means that there's a difference between being in 2D land and having a triangle that then you'd then deform, but staying in the 2D world versus a triangle that doesn't, you don't realize it's on a 3D curved surface that is not deformed, not in the not not while it's on the surface of the sphere, and that but it is deformed with the fabric of the sphere it happens to be occupying. So it's like there's some sort of fundamental difference between altered triangle in 2D space versus not altered triangle on the surface of a sphere, which is essentially a kind of 3D space, right? Like, like if you had 2D boop. But then you, I don't know, how would you, how would you bend that triangle in order to, I don't know. Anyway, it's not super important to our purposes here, but, you know, let's see. Intuition pump had come from flat space. You didn't make an adaptation when it became part of a curved system. And the curvature gave you the idea that something impossible was happening, which is that you could have three angles, all of them 90 degrees. Well, it turns out that you, it may be that the degree of failure to the, to the ability which you can measure these two quantities, position and momentum simultaneously, may be due to curvature, and it's the curvature of something called a line bundle. Okay, so now we're getting into how this metaphor applies to the uncertainty principle specifically. So with this idea, we have, you know, there's the, on 2D surface land, you have a triangle, you're like, how's it possible? Not all the, all the angles can't be 90. That's not how triangles work. It must not be a triangle all of a sudden if it has 90, 90, 90. But if you realize then that you are actually on the surface of a sphere, so there's curvature in the world that you're trying to measure, then it can still be a coherent triangle. But because it's you know changed by the curvature of the sphere, it can have 90, 90, 90 and still be a legit triangle. Now, how this applies to Heisenberg is that he's saying, <laughs> shoot, I got lost. <laughs> that the, let's go back real quick. 90 degrees. Well, it turns out that you, it may be that the degree of failure to the, to the ability which you can measure these two quantities, position and momentum simultaneously, mm -hmm. may be due to curvature. So when we look at his uncertainty principle, Hmm, maybe my understanding of the uncertainty principle is lacking here, but it's um, your lack of ability to measure coherently or speci or super accurately position and mo momentum, right? And it's the curvature of the angle, not just a bent one. So in other words, implicitly, your intuition far. pump had come from flat space. You didn't make an adaptation when it became part of a curved system, and the curvature gave you the idea that something impossible was happening, which is that you could have three angles, all of them 90 degrees. Well, it turns out that you, it may be that the degree of failure to the, to the ability which you can measure these two quantities, position and momentum simultaneously, may be due to curve. Position and momentum, right? The idea that we can, we can measure, uh, you know, accurately where something is. Whoop, that was supposed to be more of a ball. You know, where something is or 
how fast it's going, but we can't accurately get both simultaneously. And I think Brett was asking earlier, like, is that just a problem with our maps? Problem with our ability in the system of the world in order, like, like somehow our, our methods are incapable currently of getting that precision in both um, spaces, right? Position and momentum. Or is it inherent to like the universe itself? And the uncertainty principle seems to suggest that yes, it's inherent to the thing. And he's like, and therefore uh, fundamentally nothing's deterministic in the way you would think. And he's like, or Brett was arguing this, that what if the world is deterministic and it's just something about how we're able to measure, you know, there's just a failure of that mode so far. So, but Eric so far to, to try and keep us on track is saying that what if this just like you measured 90, 90, 90 on a triangle in 2D land, and then you got to 3D land and you went, oh, what, 90, or sorry, <laughs> you, you triangles don't, never have 90, 90, 90, but you have one and you're like, that doesn't make sense. That's impossible. It's a paradox. <gasps> oh, it's curved. That makes sense. It's still a triangle and it can have 90, 90, 90. In the same sense, he's saying here with this, what if your inability to measure position accurately and momentum accurately simultaneously what if that is again a problem of curvature that you're de you're you're failing to realize the space you're dealing with is curved curvature and this curvature has something to do with line bundles the, to the ability which you can measure these two quantities position and momentum simultaneously may be due to curvature and it's the curvature of something called a line bundle inside of something called geometric quantization <laughs> so it's curvature and the curvature is let me get rid of these lines real quick the curvature your inability to measure these two it's the curvature of a line bundle wow it's barely an e and this this line bundle is in what momentum simultaneously may be due to curvature and it's the curvature of something called a line bundle inside of something called geometric quantization. Inside geometric quantization. I have no idea if I'm spelling that right. Coming from Hamiltonian mechanics, which was one of the two main schools of how to do a physics problem. So you start off. And all of this is in Hamiltonian mechanics. Off with something that's fairly ancient. That you that's the Hamiltonian mechanics, I think. You could either do Hamiltonian or Lagrangian physics, two different ways of coming up with an answer of if the system starts like this, how will it develop? And there was a hidden feature. It was like an Easter egg that hadn't been found in really until, let's say, around the 1970s. Hamiltonian mechanics is the hidden feature, the Easter egg? Because you could have done Lagrangian or Hamiltonian and it was only in the 1970s that we realized oh, Hamiltonian explains more. That was the good way to go. There was a difference between these two or a useful difference between these two. And that Easter egg says, hey, you know, this upcoming thing that you're going to find in, in quantum mechanics, which is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. OK. Turns out that that's actually coming back from a, an Easter egg that was partially unearthed by uh, William Hamilton um is it william there's no. so many hamiltons that's my hamilton okay <laughs> um the hamilton uh of math hamilton math hamilton of quaternion fan forgot what his name is okay moment. i was feeling smart and then i started feeling stupid again a <laughs> i feel you i feel you hey right. i have a feeling no that's this is this is par for the course um i have a feeling that when you say curvature that I don't know what you mean because I'm very tempted to take it more literally than I should, and that it's almost like literal, literal curvature, but that there's a way in which it's more metaphorical than that. Um, but let me ask you, just to check on whether I got what you said at all. Sure. If Heisenberg's uncertainty is the result of curvature rather than actual uncertainty in linear space mm -hmm. or in 3D space, then you could have a deterministic universe in which the appearance of uncertainty would be there, but it would not actually be uncertain as a result of the fact that it is coming from curvature. Well, so kind of like how the pair, how is this rect or how is this triangle have 90, 90, 90? That's impossible. 
that doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. Oh, it's curved, that all makes sense now. It's still a coherent mathematical structure. The geometry of the triangle hasn't been somehow violated. Yeah? That's not even where the uncertainty comes from, really. Curses! <laughs> really, it should be Heisenberg's non-commutativity relationship. Oh, okay. Rather than his uncertainty principle. Non-commutativity relationship, is that right? Relationship? That's not even where the uncertainty comes from. Really, it should be Heisenberg's non-commutativity relationship. Heisenberg's non-commutativity relate relationship. I just did this right. Heisenberg's non-communicativity relationship. That's not even where the uncertainty comes from. Really, it should be Heisenberg's non-commutativity relationship rather than his uncertainty principle. So in part, the linguistics have gotten us very fouled up. So I've made the case on a recent uh, essay on my own podcast, The Portal. In this recent essay, I had to make the point, which is very tough on people, that classical mechanics is deterministic in one sector, and that sector, when it becomes quantum mechanics, is exactly as deterministic as classical mechanics. Like, all of the uncertainty in quantum theory, of quantum measurement, occurs in a second sector where classical mechanics doesn't know how to answer a problem. And so it remains mute. And you can't say it's deterministic or non-deterministic. So for example, you know, if I asked you, uh, whether you're wearing, are you either A, wearing a bandana, or B, wearing a jacket? That's a tough question. In classical mechanics, <laughs> you'd say, not a good question. Yeah. Right. In quantum mechanics, we'd say, well, 50% of the time, you'll be wearing a bandana and the jacket will disappear, and 50% of the time, you'll be wearing a jacket and the bandana will disappear. That <laughs> so, this is interesting, because... The problem with that, it's like a double bind of a kind, right? It's like you've determined in the structure of the question what is possible as a coherent answer. And the question itself, the structure of it, has um, sort of misunderstood the reality that exists beyond the structure of the question. So, like, in reality, Brett is wearing both a bandana and a jacket. But the question, because of how it's asked, are you either wearing a bandana or a jacket? Well, because the fundamental reality is both, but the question necessitates that it is one and not the other, or the other, but not this one. Like it has to be yes and no, or yes and no, but it can't be yes on both, only because of the structure of the question. This, I think, speaks to what Brett or, uh, Eric's gonna talk about later, which is about how what if the fundamental structure is a 14-dimensional manifold where everything is happening and then the 3-1 metric, right, space-time is sort of a sampling of a chunk of that 14-dimensional manifold, if I'm getting that right. I don't know. We'll see. Like, it's, it's like there's a lot of stuff happening and we're taking a slice or we're taking a sample of this m bigger metastructure and we're deciding... Right, we're 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 asking questions is another way to say that we're structuring observation, and and this is similar to asking the question: Is Brett wearing either a bandana or a jacket? Now it skews your interfacing with reality because we know he's wearing both, but you asked a question that necessitated it's one or the other, so you're gonna get strange ass paradoxical seeming answers because your question was shitty, so. It's the question is analogous to the three one metric sampling of the 14 dimensional bundle, maybe. Right. The periscope, I think, is how he'll talk about it later, like which is interesting because to me, I'm I think of it like we're looking we're we're looking into the 14 dimensional thing, which implies that we're outside of it in this, uh, you know, uh, thought experiment. But, but he seems to be almost thinking of it as like you're in the ocean and you put a periscope up into the air. 
Whereas I think of it as like you're outside and you're peering into the 14 dimensional bundle in a particular place or way or, you know, in a particular um, style. <laughs> but so he's, he's directly trying, to, I think, to uh, put a line, like a point to that this seeming uncertainty, are you wearing a bandana or a jacket, is similar to the, par it, that seems to be a paradox, right? Because when you get to quantum mechanics, he said, right, it'll be 50% of the time it'll be one, 50% of the time it's the other. And you look at that and go, how is that possible? And it's like, well, because the fundamental reality is that it's both. But your structured question kind of necessar necessarily cut things out that had nothing to do with fundamental truth or fundamental reality and had everything to do instead with your question, how you asked it, what it was about. And so that is very much like the triangle that sh that can't have 90 90 90 degrees right but if we realize that curvature sits at the heart of the thing we're looking at all of a sudden the triangle makes sense so if we're looking at you know the situation where we're trying to discern brett's what he's what brett's wearing i guess is is analogous to the fundamental truth right then the question of is a bandana is it a bandana or a jacket well, 50% of the time it's yes, bandana, 50% of the time it's yes, jacket. And you're like, that can't be. <gasps> oh, our question is deforming our understanding of the situation. There's a, there's a curvature <laughs> that explains how that question is a bad question. That, that question doesn't really make sense in a, if, if you're pursuing the truth, if you're pursuing the reality as close as an understanding of the situation as you can possibly get then asking the question is brett wearing a bandana or a jacket is a bad question and he means that sort of at a fundamental level it's deforming the information you're getting back it's the cause of you getting stuff that seems nonsensical it's the cause of you getting answers back like 50 percent of the time it's one 50 percent of the time it's the other and you're like oh well yeah, but, but deterministically like there must be a reality a truth to like is there a bandana always or is it just spontaneously come into existence when i ask the question of 50 percent of the time and that might have to do with you asked a structured question that is going to give you crazy seemingly nonsensical answers just like the paradox of a triangle that has 90 90 90. you need to understand there's some under there's some fundamental understructure here that you're missing that's causing these seemingly crazy answers and it seems like in the uncertainty situation it's the structure of the question it's how you're asking the questions. It's what questions you're asking. That's what's deforming things to give you nonsense paradox answers. Weirdness. No. That weirdness. I'm going to roll it back a little because we went off on a tangent, kind of. In quantum mechanics, we'd say, well, 50% of the time you'll be wearing a bandana and the jacket will disappear. And 50% of the time you'll be wearing a jacket and the bandana will disappear. That weirdness nobody remarks upon, which is that... And I think he would say it's because it's pointing to the deformed nature of the questions being asked. Not, it's not actually saying anything about the fundamental reality we're trying to pursue. It was in the sector where we're ex asking what I've called bad questions. That is, or I have this wrong and it's about a particular sector of physics. <laughs> every question come in quantum theory comes with an implicit multiple choice list. If the answer is not on the multiple choice list, Quantum mechanics just guesses, and it guesses according to some formula as to how likely it is to make every guess. If okay. it so every question in QM, quantum mechanics, has an implied multiple choice. And if so, either bandana, like so, bandana, yes, what, why am I writing in the air? I can do it here. Uh, Brett wearing. So say this is a quantum mechanics question, right? And it's like, A, bandana, B, jacket. And let's say that's it. That the implied multiple choices are just that. And that's the QM question. And so if the reality is he's wearing both, but your question is deforming the situation where it can't be both because there is no C. There is no C both. Hey, I'm going to do it. I'm going to Can you even see that? Um, because C isn't a choice on the multiple 
on the, on the multiple choice, then it goes, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, there's only A and B, uh, so I guess 50% of the time. So when it, when it looks at the reality of the situation, which is the answer is both, but both isn't embedded in the question asking, the implied multiple choice doesn't include the reality. So then quantum mechanics spits out an answer that says, well, I guess yeah, uh, the closest I can get in telling you the answer is half the time it'll be one, half the time it'll be the other. As if the question is sort of diving into the reality of the situation and 50% of the time it'll focus on the bandana being real and 50% of the time it'll focus on the jacket being real. And that's as best it can do. And this is sort of a description, I think, of what he means by these are bad questions. Because they have, and I don't know what makes this true. I don't know what makes it that quantum mechanics questions seem to have implied multiple choices that like the answer can only be one of the following and nothing else. And I don't think he gets into that, but maybe, maybe we will. But that is why it's a bad question. It is on the list. It always guesses correctly. And if the answer, if the fundamental reality, if he had no jacket on, right? If the, if it was possible that all he's wearing is a bandana or all he's wearing is a jacket, then quantum mechanics will give you a coherent and accurate answer. But if it's underlying multiple choices do not capture the truth of the entire reality of the situation, then that's when it's going to start giving you what seem to be weird paradoxical answers. It's completely deterministic. And so by... So Q QM is completely deterministic when its questions are coherent to the fundamental reality of what it's asking about. Like if the implied multiple choice included the choice of both, then it could have given a coherent, accurate, deterministic answer. But because it decided to ask a question that doesn't make sense with the fundamental reality being looked at, that's why it gives crazy answers. Quantum mechanics just guesses, and it guesses according to some formula as to how likely it is to make every guess. If it is on the list, it always guesses correctly. It's completely deterministic. And so by recasting, so I'm trying to get rid of the linguistic associations. You're coming in with Heisenberg, you know something, there's a cat, something about a double slit. No, you haven't even figured out why you're pissing me off yet. Okay. okay. Here's the thing. I get the quantum weirdness thing. I've stared at it. I get that fully embracing the fact that what I'm understanding can't possibly be right, and yet it is. That part, it's not that I know what to make of it, but I know how to accept it. It's interesting because I wonder if he had gotten into this deeper that he would have said, no, Brett, it's the 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 paradoxes are just like looking at a triangle with 90, 90, 90 and going, it can't be, but it is. What is this? And it's like, no, like what you're thinking you understand is like, this can't be true, but I guess it is like, it's just counterintuitive. Like human beings aren't necessarily structurally set up to understand the fundamental nature of reality in an intuitive level. Maybe that's just how it works. I wonder if he would have said, no, 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 no. It's just a deformation of your understanding. It's like the lens at which you're looking at this problem is the thing messing it up. Take off the glasses. Like, you know, stop asking bad questions, quantum mechanics, that kind of thing. I wonder. I don't know. He doesn't really get into it, though. What I don't accept is that there's any ambiguity between deterministic universe and not deterministic universe. And so I guess my question is, are you... And this almost is like a separate but related question almost, I think, compared to what Eric, the point Eric was getting into just a second ago. It's deeply related, but it's, it's actually kind of a, a different strain of inquiry. Telling me that there is some wiggle between those two, because I feel like it's completely discreet, that either there is some wiggle, right, there's some uncertainty that comes somewhere, and everything that appears to us to be somewhat uncertain is somehow bootstrapped up from that thing, or it ain't, and we are permanently billiard balls bouncing in a totally predictable way around a billiard table, and this is just some absurd, obnoxious spectacle of the illusion of chance. <laughs> wow. Well, the part of the problem is, is that you probably have an Einsteinian picture. Well, and, yes and no. And a, and a quantum mechanic, like a... But I think God does play dice. I think he has to, or evolution wouldn't work. As you, I know you don't believe that argument, but now, I believe that you have an intuition pump that yeah. it effectively says that the peculiarities of an aardvark or something are so bizarre to imagine that it's encoded into the initial state of the universe is beyond preposterous. 
Now, yeah. Stephen Wolfram is coming out with an idea that certain simple rules give birth to fabulous levels of complexity. Yeah, which is cool. If you haven't checked it out, I'll probably link something in the description below. If the Stephen Wolfram stuff has been crazy interesting, too. We saw with like the Mandelbrot set. So that, that's an entire blind alley to go down, which people like. So it's really interesting. I wonder, I wish, because I don't think he does in a second. He doesn't really get into the details, I feel like, of why he just said that. But like Stephen Wolfram, and he's going to group a bunch of people, and like that's a line of inquiry that like people like a lot. It's very attractive. It's super salient almost, but it's a blind alley. And I wish he'd gotten a bit more into like why is it a blind alley. And I think, if I had to guess, that what he's trying to say is that, or he's implying is that it's a blind alley because it's it's like if you're after what are the fundamental rules of physics it's almost like that's a blind alley because you're just looking at the fundamental mechanics of baseball and it's like yes it's a game and it happens in the fundamental space and context of physics but it's just one thing it's one avenue. It's one particular place. It has regular rules. It has regular causes and effects. It has things that you could maybe build models of or understand deeply to create predictions. But if your if your mission was to figure out the fundamental rules and understandings of physics, well, then going real deep on baseball doesn't doesn't answer that question. It doesn't get you where you're going, where you're trying to go. It gives you to the fundamental nature of that particular game. And I think that's what he means by a blind alley because it's like you've picked a particular 3-1 metric to hyper-focus on, thinking it's going to lead you to or is the fundamental nature of reality, but it's not because he's coming from the perspective of there's this 14, he'll get into it in a second, this 14-dimensional manifold where things are happening out there. They're deeply related to the 3-1 metric to space-time, but, but they're not synonymous completely. And I think that's why he calls it a blind alley. I'm not sure. There's certain... Oh, I don't want to go down the blind well, alley. Well, I'm just telling you. I'm not, I'm not asking you to explain to me why we're on one side of this puzzle, but, the other side of this puzzle, or it's an unresolvable puzzle because it doesn't mean anything. What I want to know is, do you actually know the answer to the question? The question of whether or not there's wiggle room between deterministic and non-deterministic. Let's put it this way. There's a question about what would be true if my most optimistic and aggressive version of my theory were true. Cool. I, okay. I don't buy into what you probably believe about the world, which is I don't think that right now you and I are in three dimensions having a progressing conversation in a fourth called time. Okay, so now we're getting into the juice of what he's up to. Like this is where we're going to start really getting into the meat of... Let me just create, oh, no, 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 no. Let me create a folder to put all this stuff in. Mm, no, I'll just use it as a separator. Whoopsies. There we go. Um, we're going to get into the meat of what he's, give me one second. Nope. This is the meat of his theory. We're going to get into the, the deep thing. So he, when he says, like, he doesn't believe, well, I'm going to let, we, we should, he should talk more. <laughs> yeah. So as a result of that, um, one of the issues is that you have to go beyond Einstein if you're going to resolve, resolve, if you're going to attempt to resolve any problems generated by Einstein, like black holes, why are there singular solutions? Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. So he's about to list, I, I think, a couple, at least the black holes. These are analogous to, again, being in flatland, looking at a triangle and saying, there's no way that it's 90, 90, 90, that should be impossible. And then it's kind of like you have to get underneath. And he keeps, I think he keeps saying it this way, he, you have to get beyond Einstein, which is a way of saying the same thing, right? You have to get underneath the structure that you thought previously was the, was the uh, ultimate firmament. Right? So you have to get beyond Einstein. You have to get underneath what he had to say about space and time. So he said, I don't believe that we're in three dimensions of space progressing in a slightly different way through another dimension called time. 
we have to get underneath Einstein's space-time ideas in order to truly explain. Just like looking at the triangle, 1999 should be impossible. <gasps> we understand there's an under firmament of curvature that explains how everything we previously understood is actually still accurate, is actually still true. It's just once we understand it's curved, then we're like, <gasps> it all clicks. And the previous knowledge set can get mapped onto account for the curvature and you're good. And so what he's trying to say here is that if we're, if we're looking at space time, the three one metric, um, then there's something underneath. There's some fundamental truth, reality, some understanding, some curvature maybe that has to make sense of things that we see when we look at stuff that looks kind of paradoxical or unexplainable it, when, you, when you take it from an Einsteinian perspective. If you just take his space-time configuration and understandings, then stuff like black holes, you're like, ah, it just goes to infinity, or like at the Big Bang, it just kind of goes to infinity. We're not really sure what the hell happened before that or during that, but we know with pretty good precision what happened, you know, point uh, da, 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 oh, seconds after but like at the point of zero ha ah, we don't know or infinity i'm not sure i'm not a black black hole or big bang expert but these are paradoxes just like seeing the triangle with 90 at all angles at all uh corners so the initial singularity which we sort of mapped to the time around the big bang or something right black holes big bang this the, the singularity that gave birth to the universe he's saying these are strange events that seem to produce paradoxes under or within the Einsteinian understanding. Something like that. Those problems, in my mind, and some others that I think are more significant and somehow people don't care about them. And he's saying they're fundamental, like more paradoxes that seem much more fundamental that people don't tend to discuss. Which I find bizarre. Indicate that there's something beyond Einstein. Just like looking at the triangle, saying 90 should be impossible, what explains that? And you kind of have to look beyond the triangle to find an explanation. And if there is something beyond Einstein, you have to ask all the questions that I formulated inside of his world. Yeah. Do I know what their analog is in the larger structure? So my guess is... And so here I think he's... I think he's saying the questions that got Einstein to where he was with the understanding of space-time questions he asked himself about like what happens if you're going the speed of light and somebody else is going you know you're traveling on a light beam and stuff the questions he asked that got him to the answers he got what would be that question or type of question in the thing that must exist beyond like what questions did you ask yourself about the triangle to derive triangle knowledge but then i can ask about the context in which the triangle exists in order to eventually find curvature or realize, oh, it's curved, that's the answer. Is whenever I see the amount of ink spilled over something like quantum theory and indeterminacy and uh, uncertainty and all those sorts of things, entanglement, many yeah. worlds, I immediately say, oh, sounds like people are in the wrong paradigm trying to ask questions prematurely about what would be relevant in the next paradigm. It's flat. He's about to say it. Flatland. You got it's flatland asking. Lots and lots of questions and getting really hung up on like, how are these angles 90, 90, 90? But not actually pursuing what's the contextual, larger, underneath, beyond answer. Got flatlanders. You got flatlanders fumbling around trying about to figure third. out higher dimensions would be one problem and curvature, which would be another problem. They can't figure out either of these two. And so the only reason for engaging in that stuff is usually to break the paradigm or it's recreation. It's like you're not really serious, so yeah. you might as well have a, a half hour discussion about free will, which okay. I have no interest in. So let's first- No, but there is use if you live in Flatland, right? Whoop. This guy, and you're like, oh, that's not very parallel. It's decent, sorry. Um, what's going on with my, oh, that's not an eraser, that's why. Ah. Um, if these little beings could ask about, you know, uh, uh, let's say, whoop. You know, a sphere going through flatland, right, would be the cross. This is not a great picture, but you know what I'm saying. Like the circle 
would be the interface point as it progressed through the two dimensions and then as it progressed you know like if you were to watch it in time lapse you may have seen this before it's better in 3d but like you know if you lived in flatland you would see like a small circle and then a larger and then a larger and then a larger ah uh, ah and then it would get smaller again because we're just taking a sphere and cross-sectioning it right so it is useful to look at the cross-sections as they interface with your world directly and try to derive what a three-dimensional thing might look like based on the fact that you saw a progression of circles and if and if flatlanders understood something about time then they could conceptually maybe think through something that approximates at least a model of 3dness right but they live in a two-dimensional world so it'd be hard but yeah i don't know we'll see per se sitting in three dimensions with time as a fourth dimension mm -hmm. does not describe the four-dimensional manifold. A four-dimensional manifold, my understanding would be that that's actually a four-dimensional shape. And so a creature that lives in this four-dimensional shape but experiences one of the dimensions differently, the quirk is with the creature, right? The shape is four-dimensional and the creature is, uh, you know, has an accounting system. Ish. <laughs> now we're going to get into the difficulty of how time is the same but different from space. And I don't know that by the end of this video that we really get into a succinct understanding of uh, like why that is or, or, or how exactly. He, he takes quite a few shots at trying to explain it, which I think maybe speaks to the complexity of the situation. But uh, they're kind of the same, but somehow time is different. And I think Brett's making the argument, right, that it's like the, the way the creature interfaces with this fourth dimension. He's thinking of all of them spatially, and the organism has some sort of unique relationship with the four, with the time dimension, that fourth direction, let's say. But it's interesting to me that Eric kind of goes like, eh, like it's not quite it. And so I, I, I think that points in the direction of like the confusion, at least I have around this idea. I would say that the weirdness is that if you think about it as Gladys Knight and her three pips, uh, where time is Gladys and the pips are spatial dimensions called X, Y, and Z, let's say. Um, it's interesting that time is the, f the, the front person, right? Like, whoop, shoot, why can't I draw? That's why. So she's sitting at the mic. I have no idea what her hair looks like. Um, boop. And then the three pips. all singing for like so time and then space 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 x y z that's how they're usually described right like boom 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 that's two x y z so you could put a 3d box um, that world is one in which time is somewhat broken out as special yeah. and somewhat not. Like you can trade off small amounts of time for some small amount of space. Right. This is interesting. Okay. So there's like a translative relationship between the two. Maybe that's why it's useful to talk about them as like kind of the same, but useful to also talk about them as definitely different. I forgot about this. He definitely... Like, and I think this has to do with time dilation around massive, massive objects or very, very fast objects near the speed of light and stuff. He doesn't, I don't think he gets into that much, but that might be, at least in an Einsteinian um, uh, dichotomy, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that uh, you could trade, you could trade like energy for mass and time for space. You know, like this is the, like the, you can translate one to the other and kind of, not easily, but uh, simply, maybe. It's just not easy because you need massive amounts of mass or massive amounts of energy or massive amounts of speed. Um, maybe massive was the wrong choice in there. Lots and lots of energy, mass, or speed um, to translate one to the other. So maybe that defines how they're related but different. Like time is special but you can 
do trade-offs between spatial dimensions and time dimension. And I was going to draw something. I don't even know how to draw that, like, transcommunicativity, like, turn that into that. Lots of energy. Ha-ha. You can get some time effects, which would maybe, you know, make you make less time happen for you, Flash. There we go. Now he's running. Lightning! Go, bro. Okay. Um, it's supposed to be a lightning bolt. Oof, geez. It's hard to draw without being able to put your hand on the surface of the tablet and mess everything up right now. Okay, so that explains a little bit of the peculiarity, that the connection, but difference. You can trade between them. Eas Again, easily is not it. Simply. Not necessarily easy. At least not for a human. But you can't treat time wholesale as space. Okay. So, so there's a weird way in which time is distinguished, and there's a weird way in which time is one of the, one of the band. Um, okay. So if I get you so far, yeah. um, there's, most people have a problem at the gap between three and four dimensions. They're uneasy with what it means that time is a dimension in some sense analogous to the first three. I'm there. I do that. But also different. That one pretty easily. Maybe yeah. I've got some sloppiness in my thinking about it. But you're telling me that what I don't get is that that four-dimensional universe that I'm kind of, you know, I've taken off the training wheels, but I'm no expert in, yeah. that that thing is actually the training wheel land for a larger universe that I know from past things you said is 14-dimensional. Yeah. Okay? And so then I agree when you say, oh, it's 14-dimensional, I can say, okay, well, there's, you know, there's 14 bits or something, right? It's 14-bit color, or I don't know what. I, so I can sort of understand what it would mean to have a 14-dimensional space, but I don't understand how you would know if you're in one and what its implications might be. Well, people get very hung up because they don't understand that not all dimensions are visual dimensions or spatial dimensions. So, for example, very... We're very visual. Very few people get upset when they buy a piece of uh, audio equipment and it's... Dun, dun, dun. Chord. <laughs> it says treble, mid-range, bass, volume, mm -hmm. reverb. Okay, well that's five dimensions to me. Yep. And then they're like, well that's not a real dimension. And they're thinking, and I'm saying, okay, well then now you're, and now I know what your confusion is, is that you've been told that dimensions are spatial, or visual spatial dimensions. And so you're going to reject every number that isn't three. Yep. Okay. And so I'm going to... Just, just a quirk of humanity. Like we think of two, we're incredibly visual creatures, right? So we, we almost exclusively use the term dimension, at least in common parlance, right? To, to uh, designate a specific direction in 3D space, right? Like it's that way, it's that way, or it's that way. But that's kind of a, that's because we we move in the three dimensions. That's kind of one of our primary use cases for, for the term dimension. We've used it to denote these directions in three-dimensional three space, so we don't usually use dimension when we talk about, uh, like in the audio dimension, because we're so anchored to it being a visual space you traverse. Like I'm going forward three steps, or I'm going you know left or right three steps, I'm going down three stories. Like you don't, that's what you typically mean when you say dimension. So when somebody ascribes it to like a different thing with, uh, with a beingness level that goes up and down or an, or an intensity scale that goes up and down, we don't typically use that term for it, but we could. And it seems like that's how it's being used in physics and math. I'm going to say, well, it seems to me like when you eat, when you order food, you're thinking about sweet, salty, uh, bitter, sour, pain for, you know, those chili peppers, and heat. Let's get that listed. Hold That's, on. So there's six, there's six, there's three. Yep. Okay. And so I'm going to say, well, it seems to me like when you eat, when you order food, you're thinking about sweet, salty, uh, bitter, sour, pain for, you know, those chili peppers and heat. That's, so there's six dimensions going on your tongue before I even get started. And you're not freaked out that you've got six dimensions worth of taste. And the only problem is, is that you're trying to cram those into your visual cortex. Well, how can I see them? Well, you don't see 
those tastes either. You taste them. So, you know, your, your mouth is at least six-dimensional based on what we just <laughs> said. So okay. it's very important 60. that you understand that you're not dealing with super minds or like, just a second, Brett. I'm going to see the 14th dimension. No, you can't do it because you're a mere mortal. But I, your older brother, I've seen farther than other men. Yes. All right. Um, so, okay, you are, you are solving a problem here for me. So Terrific. When you say, so I think I'm being misled then by my experience, which is the first three dimensions are similar to each other. The fourth dimension is unique feeling, but parallel in some sense to the spatial dimensions. I think, again, it's kind of like, it's it's the transcommunicativity. I probably said that super wrong. The, the ability to translate between the two simply that makes them connected but distinctly different. Or maybe the one dimension of time is parallel to the three dimensions of space or something like that. And so I have the sense of like, oh, this isn't getting easier as we add dimensions. This is getting weirder and more complex. And what you're telling me is that it may be that some of the stuff that's above the level that I can conceptualize it are simple bit flips or something that doesn't, you know, uh, add uh, indefinitely large amounts of complexity, but you need to be aware of them or else everything, every... But, but we could do the whole thing visually. So for example, cool. for those of, so those people... This is going to get a little tough. People who are watching this rather than listening to this, I'm now holding uh, my glass of recently drained kombucha, and the rim of it seems to be close to a circle. Now, if space were just one, space time were just one circular dimension. I'm still kind of a little confused as to what he means by this. Like, and maybe it's just my unfamiliarity with like geometry or stuff like that, but like, does he mean? single points like a, a billion of them and they just if you were to look at them from a two-dimensional on a two-dimensional plane they would be in a circle but we're trying to talk about them right now as one dimensional being just point 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 point, point, point. i'm not i'm not i'm not positive yeah then i would claim that the it's actually let's roll it back now if space were just one space time were just one circular dimension yeah then i would claim that the enlarged structure so in my theory four becomes 14. Um, the one dimension that is the one parameter people will think a circle is two dimension again it lives in two dimensions yep. but because there's only one degree you only need a, you only need one number to say where you are in the circle I see. Okay, and that's what defines it as one-dimensional. Is that you? Uh, you could have. It's just. So yes, he's saying right that like the confusion will come because a circle is only identified as a circle when you're looking at it on a two-dimensional plane, right? Like you're looking at it down here, and you're like, oh, that's. <laughs> he's terrified. That um, that is what makes it a circle. The fact that it's combined around like that, but, 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 if the entirety of the world was nothing but this circle, then you could give position by just one number because the rest of the circle is assumed, I think is how that makes sense. So see, because like if the circle was all there is, you just need this to define positionality in the circle. Now, if it were truly two dimensional, then you would need both axes, axes, right? Like you would need to say, I'm here. And like, you know, here's the X and Y coordinates. But, but up here on the circle, you just need like one number. I don't know, you know, like fucking position 90, you know? I don't know, I don't know how you do it on a, it, it doesn't matter, it's curved. I don't, for the thought experiment, I don't think it does. But so in 2D, you would need to like here, you would need two numbers to define that location. Again, if I was here on the circle, I only need one number to tell you where I am. And that's what determines it being one-dimensional versus two-dimensional. So, he, hmm, and he was, he was making it a, an analogy that being in one-dimensional here was like 
being in space-time, the 3, 1 metric, right? 3 space, 1 time. Um, and then that was, and then the 2D sheet that you would need to acknowledge that, oh, it is a circle, right? Like this is a circle when you look at it from above, quote, quote. But you don't need to know, quote, it's a circle if you're, if it's one dimensional land of a circle with one number to define your position. In 2D space, you need two, num two numbers to define. And the, that analogizes to the 14 dimensional, uh, I don't know what he calls this, super bundle something you know so these are like each other so let's but let's keep going forward so we have a one-dimensional space where you only need one number to define where you are on the circle that's what makes it one-dimensional put a 1d okay just give me the angle yeah right Ooh. okay so that one number would be an angle okay ah god this is going to become important too when he talks about tangents but but okay, so let's assume, you know, if you're anywhere on here, you need to, you just give the angle on the curved line that you essentially exist on, right? Like if you lived in a, a part of it, it'd look like that or that or, okay. So you only need one number in this one dimensional circle. Just give me the angle that gives me your position. Right. That circle would generate something of the one original dimension plus one one original dimension okay so the angle number is going to give us one initial dimension dimension which for me would be a way to measure length at every point on the circle so a different ruler <sighs> this is where it's getting tough let's roll back a little bit circle would generate something of the one original dimension plus one dimension, which for me would be a way to measure length at every point on the circle. Hold on. So I think what he's saying is that because it's one dimensional, right? We've got this circle, okay? And if you to, to determine a position anywhere on the circle, you just need the angle. Say the angle there, or the angle there, or the angle there, or the angle there. Theoretically, he's not saying this, and I might be misunderstanding, but what he then seems to be saying is that by the fact that you can take, say, every point on this circle and get, say, the angle number of every single point on the circle, then from that, you could live in one-dimensional land. You could be one of these little guys, right? But if you were able to, in some way, get the angle of every possible place on the circle, well then, even though you're a one-dimensional guy or a one-dimensional being that lives in one dimension, you could still surmise what the second dimension must look like, what, it, what its properties must be, because you'll get the angle at each and every place and point and then in some version of your imagination, one dimensional being, you'll be able to sketch out, oh, it must look like, if we were looking in a higher dimension, it'll look like that. Which, <gasps> the 1D angles gave us insight to the circle. So even though we can't get above the circle, even though one of these one dimensional guys can't get up here and look down and say, oh, it's a circle. Like, what he can do is measure each angle along it, and then in his little brain, he can conceptualize that it's, it looks like that. It's a circle. I think is what he's saying so far. Circle. So a different ruler. We have to go back, because he's going to start talking about ways to measure things, and this is where it gets real tough. People will think a circle is two-dimension. Again, it lives in two dimensions, yep. but because there's only one degree... You only, need a, you only need one number to say where you are in the circle. Just give me the angle, Yeah. right? That circle would generate something of the one original dimension plus one dimension, which for me would be a way to measure length at every point on the circle. So so the way in which to measure every point in the circle is what I was kind of talking about with this, like, if you were able to measure everything. 
Now, he's talking about it as a way to measure everything versus doing the actual measurement. So there's a slight difference there. So I might be misunderstanding him. But as long as you have your one dimensional, you can take the angle at any point, let's say, but where you are, right? So you're this guy right here. If you have a way to measure every angle on the circle, then that is the other dimension you now have access to, I guess, in the sense of being able to conceptualize it, I think. So a different ruler to measure lengths. So wait, 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 I don't get this yet. Every, there are an infinite... Why would you need a different ruler to measure each length? Infinite number of points around that circle, yep. right? The circle is infinitely divisible. You're saying you want a different ruler for each... So as finely as I divide, you want a different ruler for each point? I want a rule that tells me how to measure length on the line tangent to that circle. On the line tangent to that circle. Let me get a let me get a hard definition of tangent in the way I think he means that. Cuz I think it's a real specialized way of tangent of defining it. It must be a math or geometry specific, a straight line or plane that touches a curve or curved surface at a point. But if extended, it does not cross at that point. Um, touching but not intersecting a curve or a curved surface. Okay, so that's what I was thinking. So let's say you have the circle, and he's basically saying, like, yeah, the, oof, I almost had it. So where that plane meets this curve, that would be the tangent. Or I, typically I would think this direction, this, like, plane would be the tangent to the curve, tangent to the point on the curve that you're trying to measure. So he's trying to do what? A rule? To measure length. So wait, 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 I don't get this yet. Every, there are an infinite number of points around that circle, yep. right? The circle is infinitely divisible. Right. You have points, an infinite number of them. You're saying you want a different ruler for each, so as finely as I divide, you want a different ruler for each point? I want a rule that tells me how to measure length on the line tangent to that circle. So there's a line tangent to the circle, and he wants to have a rule, like an algorithm, like a process, that tells him how to measure length on any of those lines. Or line. Is it singular? Does it matter? At any given point. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. There are an infinite number of tangents to the circle. And yep. you want to measure how much of a line segment you have. You want a ruler that allows you I to... want an infinite line at every point. Okay. What does he mean by infinite line, though? Is it like... Is it like this? Like, is it... But, a, but times a billion, you know, like, oops, that's a better. Like, imagine that, but a lot more. Okay, good. Tangent to that circle. Yeah. And then I want a different ruler, a rule that tells me how I can measure distance along that line. When he says ruler, does he really mean process rule? Like, like an equation I can run, like an understanding I can employ, like a process I can, I can involve in to give me measurement I think that's what he means and I don't I don't know that that was clear to me before let's roll it back a little bit more or again rather on the line tangent to that circle a little further each so as finely as I divide you want a different ruler for each point I want a rule that tells me how to measure length on the line tangent to that circle so he wants to measure the length on that tangent so let's take like that guy. He wants to be able to measure a rule that measures length. at any given point. At any given point. So it, it matters where he is on the circle. So anywhere he is on this circle, he wants a rule that tells him how from any of these points, how to measure distance on the tangent line. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. There are an infinite number of tangents to the circle. And yep. you want to measure how much of a line segment you have. You want a ruler that allows you I to... I want an infinite line at every point. Okay. I want an infinite line 
at every point. So, it, well, yeah, that's kind of, mm, hold on, let me get rid of that. Let's uh, ju -ju 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 -ju, duplicate. Let's do that. And then, okay. So let, like this is kind of like it, right? Like we have the circle, we have infinite lines, let's say, coming out of every point. Tangent to that circle at any given point. Okay, so wait, wait, wait. There are an infinite number of tangents to the circle. And yep. you want to measure how much of a line segment you have. You want a ruler that allows you I to... I want an infinite line at every point. Infinite line at every point, which we kind of have there. Over there. Okay, good. Tangent to that circle. Every point tangent to that circle. Okay, same thing. Yeah. And then I want a different ruler, a rule that tells me how I can measure distance along that line. A rule that tells me how to measure distance on that line. Where it doesn't have to all come from one ruler that I place at every point. Oh, so it's, I think semantics is messing me up here. So, or just word choice. So he wants a rule, which I'm taking to be like a mathematical process, an algorithm, a, 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 an operation to do. that tells him how to measure the length at any, between any distance on any line, no matter where they are on the circle. To measure anywhere, any distance, any length, so that I don't have to do it from one ruler. So this sounds like gauge theory, or at least what I understand of gauge theory based on what he's described in the past, where it's like, it's kind of like, it's the same operations, but like your base level changes. So like, it's kind of like uh, doing stuff and then, oh, we have to account for curvature, right? Like the math stays the same. You just involve, oh, there's curvature in the context, in the, in the base. And then all of a sudden everything makes sense again. Like your triangles can still be triangles. And gauge theory is like, oh, do these equations. Oh, but like, here's your baseline. Okay, now it's this, now it's this. Okay, but you can still do, I believe, the base math operations and stuff. That's my, I almost know nothing about gauge theory. Um, but it sounds like gauge theory, what I understand of it. And I could be super wrong about this. But it's kind of like he wants, there's an infinite number of points on the line, or points on the, the circle. And there's an infinite number of tangents. And by that, we're going to depict them as, you know, these lines that intersect the circle at points because the circle is made up of nothing but points, right? And so, again, let's assume it's like an infinite possible, you could have every line under the sun. Let's, you know, it, it looks like a, it looks like an art project, right? It, it could, you could have infinite numbers of lines intersecting at every single possible infinite number of points around the circle. He wants to be able to, at any point in that circle, measure any distance of length on those lines and he wants to be able to do it in a way where he's not beholden to one type of ruler measuring the distances so he doesn't have one ruler and he i don't know if this is important but and like takes it through, spends time measuring here then moving here measuring there measuring there because there's one finite ruler in this whole situation so he's got a do here. I don't know if this is important that like it would take energy, time, and, and whatever process, or if it's some other problem or, or whatever. But he wants to be able to measure any distance on those lines at any point in the circle and do it with a thing that doesn't require one stable ruler type. So he wants like a, a meta process that tells him how at any point to measure any distance along any of the lines in any way <sighs> okay that's right that sounds that sounds right why that's the thing it's throwing See yeah why not use one ruler because then it seems to I could be putting words in his mouth because it seems like you're picking a metric and then in order to retain your uniformity of measurements you would want to keep one ruler at least one ruler type but he seems to be suggesting no 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 it's grander than that it needs to be something that 
can measure at any point, any distance, on any lines, and not in just one way. Okay. Seems like one ruler that you can just tell it where to measure is... Because that's how we do it in 3D space as people. It's good enough. Why? That's intuitive. Would you want a special one for each tangent? Well, because you're borrowing the fact that, that this glass is living in three-dimensional space. Oof. So now, where before his thought experiment, he was kind of like, mm, kind of ignore that it's two-dimensional circle life, right? Like he was saying like, oh, pretend you're a 1D creature on this circle, but you don't know that because you don't know the two dimension, the two dimensions you live inside you don't know about. But now he's saying like, well, that is there and being able to measure at any point in the line, any tangent, etc., you would be able to recover the fact that, oh, we live on a two dimensional plane, this is a circle. He's now saying that we're borrowing the fact that actually the glass is a three-dimensional structure. Okay, and because... Why does that matter? Because of that, and because three-dimensional space seems to have one ruler, right? Like, you don't buy a different ruler for your X dimensions, your Y, your Z. So the... You do seem to a little... Or no, I guess you don't with time. I was going to say you do, but you it only... You don't. You use the same ruler, but it squishes or lengthens depending on gravitational effects or speed of light effects massive effects right like black holes and time dilation happen at the extremes extreme mass extreme energy extreme uh, speed but but what actually happens is the ruler itself the space contracts or expands do i have that right at least in relation to each other relativity so i, I was going to say it's different measuring time but it's not really right not in the idea is you go off to Amazon or the local hardware store, you buy a ruler, and that ruler is living in three-dimensional space. Now I give you a problem, and you're like, okay, I'll, go, I'll just go get my one great ruler. Yeah. Because part of the usefulness of a ruler is its um, uniformity. It doesn't change. You measure something here, you measure something here. The inches on the ruler are the same when I had it over here as they are over here. Again, unless I put it near a black hole. <laughs> I'm going to measure at every point. Yes. Well, this circle in my story is the analog of space-time before it gets to become space-time. So, oh. so the circle is the proto-space-time. Why would you start this way? <laughs> Woo. His, his brain works in such mysterious ways. You're know, like, okay, I'll, go, I'll just go get my one great ruler, yep. and I'm going to measure at every point. Well, this circle in my story is the analog of space-time before it gets to become space-time. I think he calls this proto-space-time later, so we're gonna... This circle is proto-space-time, which is the thing that his 14-dimensional geometric unity thing is speaking to, speaking about. The thing before space-time is born, essentially, or the thing beyond Einstein, the thing underneath what we think we understand. I think he, here he kind of means it temporally, too. It's kind of like if you were talking about the birth of the universe. He's not saying this, but I'm, I'm thinking it through. That, like, it's the thing before you get, you know, like the pieces of the car before you build the car. Like... So call it proto-space-time, because what Einstein did, effectively, let's just make it weird, he said, take the four dimensions of taste on your tongue, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Okay, hold on. Whoop. That's a tongue. I don't know where these map actually, right? But let's just put places. What do you say? Sweet, sour, what? Come dimensions of taste on your tongue, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Ooh, mommy's being left out right now. <laughs> Come up with a different intensity scale for each of those things. Okay. Different intensity levels, or scales rather. Okay. Call that a ruler. Yeah, makes sense, right? It's just like a...
and then come up with angles between them. <laughs> and Brett's going to get tied up on this too. I did the first time too. Angles, he's going to talk about, are really a way of saying, like, let's let's use a different thing. Like if, dun, 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 like what is the difference between, like this is sweet and this is salty and they're, this is like a ruler of a kind, right? One to 10, or zero to 10, rather. And it's like, if this is a, let's say four, and this is an eight, it's not quite eight, is it? Um, then kind of like measuring the that difference right there, like solve for x. <laughs> ah, what? <laughs> How do I know whether sweet is very similar to sour? Because sweet and sour go well together, or is it really that it's kind of opposite? So, so is it some in... kind of del Ooh, opposites. That's interesting. So yeah, you could have like. Let's make let's make this one. Ah, it's too big. He, he made it sour. So let's talk about it in terms of sour. How do I? Come on, man. There we go. Boop boop boop. Sour. And then let's say, da, 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 da. let's say, uh, what was it? Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. Let's say, what if, yeah, what if salty like how it goes into the negatives too? Comparatively, zero. Let's do negative ten there. Bop, 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 bop. 10, 0. Yeah, what if like salty is, what if it's only negative though in comparison to sour or something, you know? So like salt for y. But when compared to bitter, what if, ooh, what if it's like just a little, like, you know, a 1. That's like a negative 7. You know, and this, yeah, so they're very relational. They're very relational. Well, for Z, don't mistake those for coordinates. Delta between the experience. Or maybe you could. <laughs> Ruler. And then come up with angles between them. Ah, uh, what? Those would be angles, right? Like X, is, that's an angle. It's an angle. That's an angle. Because you're comparing, you're comparing them, and it would, seems like it would be really important to pick something in relationship to another, what's the the angle? What's the variable? What's the he's gonna use protractors to explain this. Like that makes some sense. How do I know whether sweet is very similar to sour? Because sweet and sour go well together, or is it really that it's kind of opposite? So, so is it some kind of delta between the experiences? Right. How different is sweetness? We don't know. So I'm trying to invent a world which isn't the three-dimensional world in which you and I seem to be. You're trying to find an analog world, and of course... I'm trying to build you an intuition pump. Yeah. So the idea is that your visual cortex in the back of your head, since we're doing biology, yeah. is a huge hindrance to you. Yeah. And that huge hindrance is that you're going to map everything back to that, and since everything came with rulers and protractors, yeah. you're not going to be able to think about a world before rulers and protractors. So and what I think what he means here too is he's saying you're you're going to come at everything with in a world with rulers and protractors. It sounds like he means specifically a ruler, and specifically a at least kind of protractor, like a kind of ruler and a kind of protractor that you then use one ruler everywhere you look. You measure it with that one and a protractor. You use that to measure angle wherever you need to measure an angle, but it's one protractor and one uh, ruler or one kind of ruler and one kind of protractor. I think is what he means. And since Einstein's principal insight, with Grossman, I might add, this is before Einstein breaks out into GR as most physicists now think about it. General relativity. Was to say, I bet that the geometry that we call differential geometry or Riemannian geometry or semi-Riemannian or pseudo-Riemannian, whatever this kind of geometry was that came up in Germany way back when, this geometry is the right way to model our universe. 
but your universe contains the geometric assumptions already. So you're sort of saying like, I don't understand. What did he do? Doesn't seem like much. So, I oh, so we're saying that Einstein looked around with this Ramanian geometry or semi, I don't know why he's listing many. Is it like they're interchangeable or it doesn't matter which one won the debate about which was accurate or more accurate? Da, 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 da. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to roll that back a little bit. Before Einstein breaks out into GR as most... So before he gets to general relativity... Most physicists now think about it, was to say, I bet that the geometry that we call differential geometry or Riemannian geometry or semi-Riemannian... He said, this geometry, whatever one... Or pseudo-Riemannian, whatever this kind of geometry was that came up in Germany... A specific kind that came up in Germany, I guess. Way back when. This geometry is the right way to model our universe. This geometry is the right way to model the universe. Okay. But your universe contains the geometric... This geometry we figured out is the right way to model the universe. But I live in a world where geometry is already a thing. And where a specific type of geometric ruler and protractor already exist, have already been selected, are already utilized, just in the existent space, I think, is what he's saying. Assumption. And that's why it seems like, what did he do? He just said, geometry is geometry. And he just picked the rulers and protractors we already have and said, that's what we should do to explain this. And then Eric's trying to get underneath that to the land before those rulers and protractors existed already. So you're sort of saying like, I don't understand. What did he do? Doesn't seem like much. So I'm trying to say, okay, let's talk about your tongue. We know, for example, that there's like a Scoville scale for pain for peppers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's weird. That's a ruler. That's a... Okay. So we've got, whoop, there's a guy. There's his mouth. He's having a good time. There's his tongue. And then spicy... And there is a scale for rating the hotness of peppers. Scoville scale. The Scoville scale. He's, yeah, that's true. Okay. And that is a, a dimension, right? You could be somewhere on this scale. Ruler to tell you how. How and. Let's move it back. This geometry is the right way to model our universe. But your universe contains the geometric assumptions already. So you're sort of saying, like, I don't understand. What did he do? Doesn't seem like much. The rulers we find in our normal world, like just like lying around, assume somebody made one, already have baked inside them a particular type of ruler and a particular type of protractor set. That's what it means by geometric assumptions. They're already baked in. And that's why you could claim, looking at Einstein's stuff, going, oh, what did he do? He just said, the one you find is the one we should use. The one baked in is the one we should use. So I'm trying to say, okay, let's talk about your tongue. We know, for example, that there's like a Scoville scale for pain for peppers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's weird. That's a ruler. That's a ruler to tell you how... How intense okay, sensation I, My guess is that people who make artificial sweeteners probably have a sweetness scale. I didn't look this up beforehand, but I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, it'd be crazy if they didn't, right? How do they compare their new artificial sweetener against sugar or aspartame or Splenda or whatever? Yep. Let's, let's put that on the board. We got a boop. Sweetness, not that this guy should be the guy having a good time. Ah. No, he's just content. So hot, sweet. All right, let's say it's super sweet. Looks like some Willy Wonka candy up in here. Okay, let's say that's out of 100 too. Those, that's kind of arbitrary, One, zero to 100. And we don't know how the sweetness scale and the pain scale interact. Right. We're not sure. Like, these, like... And this is why he talks about it in terms of rulers and protractors. Because measuring the sweetness, right, could be sort of a... You pick a scale and you're going to measure 1 to 0, or 0 to 100. And then same thing with the hotness over here. 
But then when you're going to decide, like, how they compare to one another, it could be that, like, you know, hotness is here and sweetness is here. As far as, like, how they relate to each other natively, just in general, or, like, the levels. Like, if you took this level and this level and compare them, it's only that. Or is it some inverse relationship, you know? Like, is it somehow this because one of them's negative to the other that's why you need protractors that are distinctly different from the rulers like are those the same ruler was there any thought of the intensity to make sure that it's common between the recept receptors like you know wh what is the threshold to get your attention maybe the idea is below a certain threshold you don't it doesn't get your attention and yeah. you call that one now you've normalized your rulers across all of the different tastes my point in this is when it comes to pure taste, forget pain and forget heat for the moment. Yeah. You've got four major kinds of receptor that we know about. Those four receptors are like proto space time. It's like Einstein before he puts the metric, which is the rulers and protractors, on the thing that we call space time. You and I are inheriting rulers and protractors from Einstein's space time. Okay, so. I and he means that like as an intellectual tradition, right? Like our understanding of culture and science is informed by this baked in Einsteinian understanding is what he means, I think, versus something else. I, I get the intuition pump problem. Okay. I get the, the analogy that's throwing me, but I can correct for it with the, the tongue because obviously that's an evolutionary space and how intense the pain is has everything to it's do with it. It's just four degrees of freedom that yeah. didn't come equipped with the thing that you're always going to say, like, I don't understand. We have rulers and protractors. Just go out and get one and measure stuff. Yeah. And the idea is, okay, well, on your tongue, you don't have that. So when you say rulers and protractors, yep. this is, I'm, I don't know if this is right, but I'm asking you. You are saying there are two different kinds of delta where you want to measure the difference between two things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're talking about something analogous to a length. Then you yep. need a ruler. Right. Sometimes you're talking about something that's you know, an angle difference. You want a protractor. Perfect. Okay. Yep. What I don't get is what length and angle are analogized to. I know how length, I know how lengths and angles work, but I don't know. Well, we would say, in 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 grown up math land, is, oh, at every point you need a metric, which is a symmetric non degenerate two tensor. Now every point you need a metric now he previously just called a metric einstein's geometry like i'm, I'm paraphrasing but like why, how am i more yellow than before it's a very yellow light <clears throat> you need a metric and einstein said let's use the metric that seems to be baked in to where everywhere we are or something i could be butchering that so we need a metric and so he's I know how lanes, I know how lanes and angles work, but I don't know. Well, we would say in, in, in grown up math land, grown up math land, it's going to get tough here is, oh, at every point, at every point, assumingly at any point you want to make measurements and stuff, any point you care to do something with. So at every point, whoop, you need a metric, which is a symmetric. You need a metric which has the following character or is the following thing. You need a metric. Oof. Which is, let's write that out. I was going to do equals, but I obfuscates a little bit. Metric non degenerate two tensor. Ugh, a symmetric non degenerate two tensor? In, in grown up math land, is oh, at every point you need a metric. At every point, which is a metric, which is a symmetric non. Symmetric? Degenerate. Degenerate two tensor. It's like TWO. Ten ER or OR. I don't know. That's a bunch of language. Wait, wait, bunch try, of try that again slower. There. 
symmetrical. Let's look it up real quick to make sure that I'm like, maybe there's a math um, definition that I'm unfamiliar with or something. Not a map, what? Symmetric. Made up of exactly similar parts facing each other or, or around an, as an axis. So, so uh, symmetrical. So you need a symmetric and non-degenerate two tensor. So the important part is that it's a two tensor that's symmetrical, right? So like butterfly is symmetrical, right? Each side looks like the other if you divide it up along that axis. axis. So it's symmetric and it's non-degenerate, which he's going to get into later. I don't know enough math to know what exactly defines non-degenerate. And it's a two tensor. He says this doesn't matter though. It's too, or it's more complicated than it needs to be for the current, uh, whatever. There's a gadget, which is effectively a combination ruler and protractor. Okay. So there is this thing. At, if, at every point, you need a metric, which is a gadget, which something, something, something. And you have to extract length. And it's a, well, it's, it's a gadget, but it's a combined ruler and protractor. Style and angle style information from it. You can get length and angle from it. St length, style, info, um, angle, style, info. But it's basically in four dimensions, a four by. It's four dimensional. By four matrix. A four by four matrix. Oh, I'm gonna mess this up. One. There we go. One, two, three, four. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yep. Four by four matrix, but it's four dimensional. So 16 entries. Right. In which, if you flip across the diagonal going from the northwest to the northwest, southeast, it has to be symmetric under a flip. So once you've got the top triangle of that diagram, concentrated in the northeast corner and you so like boop 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 and boop 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 if you were to flip these you would get the same thing they would again be the same flip that into the southwest all the information is reflected. From that object, I can get length and angle information. So what, when I... Somehow, <laughs> this two denser device that gives you length style info and angle style info, and that can flip symmetrically across this axis, I guess. If you do it, that device gives you... And you flip that into the Southwest, all the information is reflected. From that object, I can get length and angle information. You can get length and angle, which makes sense, right? We already said it gives you length style info and, and angle style info. You can get length and angle from this two tensor. So what, when I, whenever I talk to lay audiences, I don't talk about symmetric non-degenerate two tensors. You do more than you think, but... Much less than m m my colleagues. Okay. I talk about, oh, it's just rulers and protractors. Because those are the two key measurement things that measurement information pieces that you get out of this two tensor and length and angle are familiar to lay audiences okay so really the two tensor is a bit of magic an object that you can understand in greater complexity if you go looking but basically it gives you length and it gives you angle over and over again you'll hear me talk about rulers and protractors so what i'm really talking about to a math audience is a four by four matrix at every point in essence symmetric about its diagonal, but the content of that is, at least as far as Einstein was pushing it, I'm pushing it farther, just ruler and protractor information. And from that, it turns out that curvature is an emergent quantity, which is kind of a... How... I don't think he gets into how this makes sense, but it does, apparently. I'm just going to take his word for it, right? Like, somehow this two tensor how it gives you info that it can be like symmetric on the corners around this axis here you could flip it and get it blah blah blah. you get length and you get angle oof 
And somehow, as a consequence of this symmetric, non-degenerate, in parentheses, uh, two tensor, you get length and angle, and somehow, as a logical consequence of all of this, you get curvature. Oh shoot, is it A or e? I? Ah. Science shock. We all sort of think we know what we mean by saying something is curved. Mathematicians figured out, oh, it turns out you can recover curvature as a consequence of just having rulers and protractors, which is a highly non-trivial observation. Right, because it is, what? Just by recovering length and angle. And I'm specifically, I think it's about recovering length and angle from two tensors, that you can recover the fact that, oh, there's curvature. That nothing about that was obvious until somebody figured it out in math land and went, oh, this means everything's curved at its base. Kind of like the, the, what was it, the, the H thing? Harris, <laughs> I was going to say a ranch name or something. The Hamilton Mechanics, Hamilton Mechanics. Like they figured out like, oh, it's curvature underneath there. It's like something about symmetric non-degenerate two tensors. From that, we recover the fact that, oh, there's curvature in here. And that was not obvious at all. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as uh, hinted at by the mechanism that both. I feel like it's going to be useful to go back like two full minutes here. And because now I've lost the plot on like why he was talking about the two tensor and length and angle so much. So let's go back a bit concentrated in the northeast corner and you flip oh that's not nearly far enough i don't understand we have rulers and protractors just go out and get one and measure stuff yeah and the idea is okay well on your tongue you don't have that so when you say rulers and protractors yep this is i'm i don't know if this is right but i'm asking you you are saying there are two different kinds of delta where you want to measure the difference between two things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're talking about something analogous to a length, then you yep. need a ruler. Right. Sometimes you're talking about something that's you know, an angle difference. You want a protractor. Perfect. Okay. Yep. What I don't get is what length and angle are analogized to. I know how length I know how lengths and angles work, but I don't know Well we would say in, in, in grown up math land is oh at every point you need a metric which is a symmetric non-degenerate two tensor. Now, that's a bunch of language. So the two tensor gives you your metric. Okay, bunch try, of... try that again slower. There is a gadget, which is effectively a combination ruler and protractor, and you have to extract length style and angle style information from it. But it's basically, in four dimensions, a four by four matrix, so 16 entries, in which if you flip across the diagonal going from the northwest to the southeast, it has to be symmetric under a flip. So once you've got the top triangle of that diagram concentrated in the northeast corner, and you flip that into the southwest, all the information is reflected. It occurs to me now, I did those. I didn't, the northeast and southwest should be like that. Oh, whoops, no, no, no. So it should be like that. There we go. From that object, I can get length and angle information. So what, when I, whenever I talk to lay audiences, I don't talk about symmetric non-degenerate two tensors. You do more than you think, but. Much less than m m my colleagues. Okay. I talk about, oh, it's just rulers and protractors. And over and over again, you'll hear me talk about rulers and protractors. So what I'm really talking about to a math audience is a four by four matrix at every point in essence symmetric about its diagonal, but the content of that is, at least as far as Einstein was pushing it, I'm pushing it farther, just ruler and protractor information. And from that, it turns out that curvature is an emergent quantity, which is kind of a giant shock. We all sort of think we know what we mean by saying something is curved. Mathematicians figured out, oh, it turns out you can recover curvature as a consequence of just having rulers and protractors, which is a highly non-trivial observation. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as uh, hinted at by the mechanism that both the Greeks and the Chinese used to figure out pi, to sort of narrow in on pi, right? That basically what you're using 
is non-curved math to approximate what happens as you get to curvature? Well, we have a series of things that we do. Like the idea of a tangent vector, when we have the rim of my glass, and I talk about the line tangent to the glass, you can see. Yes. I feel like this is going to get complicated. That's so we have the rim of his glass. We have boop, the tangent. Let's say the point where they intersect. Say, well, if you don't put your glass inside of a three-dimensional world, how do you know about the line tangent? Right, because if you live on the circle, you're one-dimensional. You don't know anything about three dimensions that would give you an idea of, like, where a tangent could exist in relationship to the surface of, or the, the rim of the glass. And mathematicians say, ah, we don't actually need to put the glass and its rim inside of a larger space. We used to, but now... <laughs> okay, we used to be, we used to need to do this whole thought experiment here to get an idea of where this is comparatively to the rim, but... Now we learned how to talk about tangent, see, from the point of view of differential operators and... Now we can get tangent just from differential operators. Newton's calculus. Plus calculus. So they don't need to do this whole like 3D modeling. Instead, they can just run some numbers. They can or just run some differential operator and calculus, and boom, get it that way. Like, okay, so the the. So you don't need the dimensional super context in order to get the information. You can just run these equations and and processes. Analog. The, sorry. The. The concept that you learn about in high school is something having magnitude and direction. Yeah. Turns out to be a differential operator. Okay, so it's just like this piece of math over here. It turns out like you can they're the same enough to completely just use them instead. Yep. Well, actually, I was just going to ask you about this. Yeah. Is, is the reason that we are talking about rulers and protractors because of their relationship to uh, a vector? Well, it's, it is vectors that we are measuring to say what their length is and what their angle is. Yeah. Even the word length is a lie because there are non-zero vectors that everyone would agree that is non-zero that would have non-zero length. Sorry, that would have zero length. Zero length. So you have non-zero vectors which have zero length. So a vector with numbers, right? And I, like, let me pull up vector again, make sure that there isn't some specialized math meaning of vector that I'm missing. A quantity having direction as well as magnitude, especially as determining the position of one point in space relative to another. Again, it sounds like his explanations of gauge, gauge theory. Okay, quantity having direction as well as magnitude. So I guess that's right, like, that's a direction. And I guess the, the like, type of change here is the, the magnitude. Okay, whatever. So he's saying that there's, roll it back. Are measuring to say what their length is and what their angle is. Yeah. Even the word length is a lie because there are non-zero vectors that everyone would agree that is non-zero that would have non-zero length. Sorry, they would have zero length. Zero length. So you have non-zero vectors which have zero length. So it has like an angle but not a length? So is it maybe more sensical to do this like in our scales? You know, it's like this one has a thing of zero. And this has a thing of five or something. So the vector x there has, you know, let's say fucking three, I don't know. So, but this has zero, but it does have, so it has zero length, but it has a vector of three. I think that's what he's saying. Because we took a word that you know very well, and then we borrowed it someplace where you really don't have any intuition at all, and now I just, you know, it's like blowing somebody's mind at a, 
Christmas party. Wait, there are vectors that are not zero, but they have zero length. You're like, wow, tell me more. Well, it's 100% having to do with the linguistic encoding of the word length. It does not have to do, I mean, there's obviously a tremendous amount of weirdness that happens at zero. Which well, I'm not, us, claiming that, I'm not claiming it's not weird, but it's not as weird as saying that a non-zero object has zero length. That's like what physicists and math people do to blow people's minds and get them interested in the subject, and then we unblow your mind later by teaching you what we really meant. So it's kind of a not my favorite way of getting people in the door of math and physics. You've got something that agrees with the concept of length in the realm that you're familiar with it that extends into a realm that you've never thought much about. So if you extend the word length, you blow your own mind. But if you were to say um, like something about the weight of a vector, and I could say, well, this vector has weight zero, but it is not zero itself. Right? Yeah. So that, then the idea... You use weight there very because, carefully because you can get... It's about like dimensions of information, kind of. Zero weight without having zero mass. And so the first time you realize that... So, a so at some level, if I, if, I, if I call it length, which is to extend the word that you already knew, yeah. then you'll have the wrong intuition. So what I did was I cleverly sort of misdirected you as a magician into wrong intuition and that caused your mind to explode and that, then I, I get to go home saying, well, I'm smarter than he is and I hate that game. Okay, good. So, all right, there's some sort of 14-dimensional space. You've well, let me just, just say a little word about that. Okay. Imagine that your proto-space time was like an infinitely thin hairband. Oof, I wonder if this is supposed to be treated the same as the circle. Because a hairband is 3D. Right? It's a tube that's stuck to itself. But I wonder if he wants us to care about that three-dimensionality or not care about that. I, I don't know. Okay. So you have an infinitely something hairband. Let's do this way. If you started off with an infinitely thin hairband, mm -hmm. then for every point on that hairband, imagine the space of all possible things that you might call of unit length, all possible rulers. Okay. And allow that a ruler can be either marked with positive numbers or negative numbers for whatever reason. Yep. But you're not allowed to choose the zero ruler. There is no way in which you can claim that everything is of zero length or infinite length. I don't understand. This is what the non-degenerate part of the uh, symmetric but non-degenerate two tensor is. Uh, non-degenerate somehow means like non not having values that reach absurdity is what he seems to say later. I could be misinterpreting that completely, but zero and infinity both give you nonsense. So you like cut them out. You can't use them because they give you nonsense. Then what a zero ruler would be. Let's not worry too much about it. Okay. What I would claim is that the object that I would create, if I did the same thing, which I'm doing to four dimensions, turning it into 14, would turn the hairband into two toilet paper cores, the cardboard cores, which would be two disconnected cylinders. And you could see that the circular nature of the hairband would be represented in the circular nature. Okay, so I get it. So you, get a, you take a band. Let's imagine that this was done on a computer screen. Right. You've got a circle, right? This mm -hmm. uh, hairband of no dimension. Right. And you stretch it across something. That gives you a tube. Well, what I would say is, is that along that tube is every possible, going lengthwise down the tube, is every possible ruler with the same sign. So the reason you have two... Ah, is because there's a positive and a negative. There's a positive and a negative. That's why you have two... So effectively, you took a long tube, you cut yep. the middle part of the tube out, because those, that would be the degenerate metrics. So is this... You can't have one tube that goes from positive through negative because of a divide by zero problem? You can't have that because then you would say that there are directions which can't be measured as, as having a non-zero weight, if you will, or, or length, or whatever you want to call it, uh, relative to every possible thing. So every possible measurement could yield zero if you choose a degenerate symmetric two tensor. So remember, some things can... Remember, it needs to be a non-degenerate.
two tensor. <laughs> that doesn't say why, but it's that's what he's trying to get at. But it, he's trying to explain why, why, what, like basically what the degenerate in there means. Let's roll it back just a teeny bit. Uh, relative to every possible thing, so every possible. Me- there are directions which can't be measured as, as having a non-zero weight, if you will, or, or length, or whatever you want to call it, uh, relative to every possible thing. So it sounds like generate is you... Mm. So every possible measurement could yield zero if you choose a degenerate... If you involve the degenerate, then any possible measurement could equal zero, and therefore it's like a useless measurement system. Symmetric two tensor. So remember, things can only serve as rulers and protractors if they aren't pathological. And pathological would be any possible measurement maybe equaling zero no matter what's going on, which is what we just described as degenerate. So all we're doing is getting rid of the stuff that is pathological and saying, I'm sorry that there was a little bit of fly in your soup, sir. We've, we've, we've removed all the flies so, from you. I still want to know, when you say pathological, zero is weirdly pathological. You know, there, you can't divide by zero or you'll b- blow your computer up, right? So there's a problem with zero that doesn't tell you anything about immediately adjacent space. We don't know of any way of handling the case where the rulers and protractors are effectively going to return zero for certain directions in all circumstances. So, you better... So in all circumstances, certain directions always equal zero. That's what makes it degenerate. That certain... Let's go with spaces, though that might be very off. If you, you could get zero across all cases in that particular direction, that's what makes it degenerate. Off, just saying, look, we can deal with this toilet paper tube and we can deal with that, that toilet, toilet paper, paper tube, tube. And they don't right. connect, but that's okay, okay because, yeah, okay, got it. So now, if we, if we took the hairband and then we said, you know what, let's, let's up our game a little bit. Because the hairband, you can't, there's no space. It's either all space or all time, depending upon whether you chose the plus rulers or the minus rulers. If you chose the minus rulers, it's all time. If you chose the plus rulers, it's all space. Okay, wait, you're blowing my mind. Stop it. Um, Why would the sign, is that arbitrary? Sort of. Okay. So in other words, it doesn't tell... Interesting you said sort of instead of yes or no. Tell you that space should be plus and time should be minus. It just tells you, I need someone... So you could swap them. Could be space over here, could be time over here. Doesn't really matter. Or it seems not to matter. Way of distinguishing some time from some space. You just have to pick. One has to be one, one has to be the other. And if you want to do everything backwards from my conventions, feel free to call space negative and time positive. Got it. And I believe that the East Coast and the West Coast of the U.S. chose different conventions in terms of the university department. Oh, really? I think there's. Oof. Way to make your lives harder, guys. It's an East... There's a physics thing. Mathematicians almost never. We know about this stuff, but it's not our lifeblood. In general, we prefer everything to be all plus, all plus or all negative. Right? We would call that Ramon... For simplicity, I'm assuming. Ramonian geometry. We know about semi-Ramonian geometry. It's just not very important to us. It ha- Ramonian is everything's plus or everything's negative. You don't mix them up. Semi Ramanian is you mix them up. It happens that the one case of geometry that's really important in the outside world, it's mixed because it's one time and three space. So, are you telling me that mathematicians are forced into a landscape of half plus and half minus in this when case? When we want. Not half and half necessarily, but mixed. And I don't know about forced. I mean, they are if they want to talk about physics stuff, which seems to be like if we want to do the really important and useful stuff, we do have to get semi Ramanian and get mix it up. Seems like it would just make it harder to keep track of stuff. That's all. We want to talk about general relativity. Yeah. And when we want to talk about physics, we know that the case that we don't like, which is mixed signature, yeah. is the one that is physically relevant. So it's, it's sort of perverse. Because, and why is it mixed? Because... Time is one, and space is the other, 
and the world we live in is a time-space situation, so you're going to have to use both. You can't just do space, you can't just do time. Because even if you tried to do just space, it would warp in the presence in a time-based way. It would warp um, when you get like near black holes or supermassive objects, and time, when you get time dil dilation effects, it affects space. So you can pretend that one doesn't exist or the other, but it'll still mess you up if you want a full picture of what's going on. That's, I think. That we would prefer to be in what would be called Euclidean signature, that is all plus or all minus. Mm -hmm. So just deal with plus, just deal with negative, just deal with time, just deal with space, one or the other, but not both. And that's where we do our geometry. But our physicist friends, the one case that they really like is this mixed signature case. And it sounds like it's not even that they necessarily like it. It's just that it ac accurately models our actual lived reality space. Like it's not, it's not like, it sounds, and I could be wrong, but it sounds like it's less of a preference of the field and more of a necessity of what the field's studying. Okay, so is it that they are bringing this stuff to the table that forces you into their zone? We came up with an abstraction. Yeah. In the land of all plus or all minus. They applied it in one case. And I think, I might be wrong, but I think the case is the real physical 3-1 metric, the three, you know, the, the time, space time. So our, our, imagine you're a software company. Yeah. And you didn't correctly anticipate who would want to run your, your software. So you've got one amazing government contract, let's imagine. Yeah. And it's for a use that you never imagined would be your leading use case. Like somebody's got a weird use of your product, and that's your only client. So like a ticketing system that used to do like bus tickets for like Greyhound or something, but then they get a big contract with a huge theme park, Disney, and then... Now that's like their primary use case, but they built everything for like bus and travel stuff, but now they're doing ticketing for like a stationary location that deals with all kinds of different types of tickets, types of visitors, types of sales, types of couponing, types of, you know, uh, t temporal based um, deals and stuff. So now all of a sudden you're like, oh, all the stuff that I had to do with travel is less useful and less necessary and all this stuff about like windows of availability of things and timing and things are more important. So your only client outside of your pure shop that's keeping you afloat is in the one case that your engineers don't like working on that much. So in this case, I would say it turns out that the physics community keeps us interested in a class of equations called hyperbolic equations that are really important that maybe we would discount and it, we'd stay in the case of what we'd call elliptic equations. So I was going to say, though, okay. is, is that if you, if you up the game and you say, okay, now I want to play with two dimensions, so I have one time dimension and one space dimension, at least that starts to sound like reality because space and time are different. Do, do my paper towel cores make sense still? <laughs> yep. So then you'd be in a two-dimensional world, and you'd have one ruler. In Maybe we should draw new things for this two-dimensional world in the time dimension one ruler in the in the space dimensions one ruler time one ruler space so think about a watch versus an actual ruler right I guess yeah Oh, it's terrible. Let's try that again. It's so small. That works. Those parentheses. And you'd have an angle between the two, which would be your protractor. Okay. How do I? <laughs> Give me a protractor real quick. It's been a long time since I've seen one. Oh, I can't. Protractor. Oh, right. Oh, okay, I'm thinking, yeah, all right. Huh, I guess they could be a plastic. 
I was thinking the old school ones where it's like a, you know, thing. It's a post coming out the top, and it's got like the little spiky dude, and it measures. Oh, actually, that's trash. Maybe I should just, because you would put something here to measure angles, right? Like you could, you could measure angles. You could turn it on that top knob. Or this is a kind of protractor too, I guess. It just measures angles and you put it against some edge, I guess. I don't, I don't use that one. I don't use either of them very often. So that'd be three pieces of, of extra data. And then if you threw out just the way you cut through that, like, let's say, paper towel core, to have your positive and your negative, now you've got three pieces of that three-dimensional space of two rulers plus one protractor. And it looks like a giant butterfly. And it takes three-dimensional space. Hold on, I have no idea what he's just saying. How does that relate to the paper towel? If you up the game and you say, okay, now I want to play with two dimensions, so I have one time dimension and one space dimension, at least that starts to sound like reality because space and time are different. Yep. So then you'd be in a two-dimensional world and you'd have one ruler in the time dimension, one ruler in the, in the space dimension, so think about a watch versus an actual ruler, and you'd have an angle between the two, which would be your protractor. So that'd be three pieces of, it, of extra data. And then if you threw out just the way you cut through that, like, let's say, paper towel core, oh. to have your positive and your negative, now you've got three pieces of that three-dimensional space of two rulers plus one protractor. And so he, he was just mentioning the paper towel core to say, again, just like we threw out zero, just like we threw out the middle, do with that again with the time-space angle. So now it's like... We could almost just say like we have, oh shoot, okay, like we have length, space, we have time, you know, a watch, and we have like some sort of angle measurement between them. And we, we got rid of zero, which I don't know what that looks like exactly. Like two-dimensional space, you get rid of the zero area of the map? I don't know. And it looks like a giant butterfly. And it takes three-dimensional space, and it cuts out. It looks, or you, you know that thing jugglers use called a Diablo? Okay, hold on. So, da -da 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 -da. so he is kind of talking about the paper towel core, but maybe it's like an analogy, so... Like, so, say that's time, that's space. Angle isn't necessarily like the z-axis, but let's say that's angle, right? So we'll do time, space, angle, and then we're going to cut out the middle, and then I guess we're going to pretend there's paper towel cores here, too. We're going to cut out this middle, because, again, once we get near zero... We need to get rid of that business because that's where the degenerate stuff happens. So we get that. What does a Diablo look like? I might either put a Diablo picture in the video, but the easier way would be to draw it if I... So I don't have to spend any time. Oh, geez. The game is much more popular. Uh, nope, that's not it either. Juggling... It looks, yeah, it looks like this. There's like a tiny metal connector. And then essentially this. Imagine those are symmetric. And you put the, um, not wire, rope, the, the string. So it looks like you, you, like a person would stand here as a juggler and they would have their hands on the rope and it would go so I guess it would actually be 
like if the string was like that, it would be like, they're almost cones more than anything else. So like maybe like this. And again, the string goes that way. Which, Which is one? like, oh, the, like a, the it's bar. Like, it's a wheel on a string. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's. Think like the center of a yo yo right here. Sort of the, the bad stuff now looks like kind of the beginning of a Diablo. And so you have three sections two in the wings, call it a butterfly, and then there's one that kind of goes around where the string would normally go on that kind of flywheel contraption. But you get like kind of the beginning of a Diablo. And so you have three sections, two in the wings, call it a butterfly, and then there's one that kind of goes around where the string would normally go on that kind of flywheel contraption. And those three things would be the three different possible signatures. Two, two of time, none of space, one of time and one of space, two of space, none of time. What? Wings, call it a butterfly, and then there's one that kind of goes around where the string would normally go on that kind of flywheel contraption. And those three things would be the three different possible signatures. Two, two of time, none of space, one of time and one of space, two of space, none of time. So those are the three possible ways of dividing up two dimensions into three, into space and time. Okay. This is, this is one of many points along the way where I begin to doubt that I know what we are even discussing. Well, all I'm trying to get at is... <laughs> Seconded. Oh my goodness. People want to know what's new, what are you doing? And they don't usually go back to, well, what have we already established is pretty solid and interesting. So Einstein told us that space-time is four dimensions, four possible degrees of freedom, with rulers and protractors, and the ruler that goes in the direction of the time is of a different nature than the rulers that go in the direction of space. And there are six angles rather than, in this case that we just did, one angle. Well, all I'm trying to get at is people want to know what's new, what are you doing? And they don't usually go back to, well, what have we already established is pretty solid and interesting. So Einstein told us that space-time is four dimensions. Four dimensions, which is a little hard to draw, especially on two dimensions, but let's go with that's three. Right, that's a cube. And then... You know, imagine that that direction is time. Four possible degrees of freedom. Right, X, Y, oop, that looks like a Y, or X, Z, and that's time. With rulers and protractors. It's 4D. With rulers and protractors, so abilities to measure these directions. Right. Those are rulers. <laughs> That's what that is, I promise. And then we're going to put a little watch. And the ruler that goes in the direction of the time is of a different nature than the rulers that go in the direction of space. And there are six angles rather than in this case that we just did. Six angles. Okay. One angle, because there was only one time and one space. And that is where we begin the puzzle, which is how does one disintermediate Einstein? Like, if Einstein has a flaw, and Einstein's flaw is holding us back, and by the way, this is a terrifying thing to say because we all love Einstein sure. so much, we don't, get, we don't want to get rid of the guy. Yeah, we can't disentangle the lovable guy who made huge progress from the possibility that where his work peters well, out. Well, you have to stuck. trust that you're gonna that what you do will honor him in the end, but you can't honor him in the middle. You actually yep. have to go after him in the middle, which yep. is the tough part, right? And 
and in some sense, he was just such a beautiful soul that we also want to make sure that we don't do any damage to that soul. Yeah. Okay. So in this situation, what I would say is Einstein threw away all but the space-time metric that he believed in. So in other words, he did... So the rulers and the watch and maybe the angles, the six angles? He didn't allow the stuff in the universe to dance on top of the rulers and protractors. Right. Instead, he took the stuff and applied rulers and protractors of the same kind of stuff to the stuff. He didn't use protractors and rulers before the matter of the universe. Instead, he used it after it's here. And therefore, by as a consequence, his rulers and protractors are made of the same type of stuff as the universe, as the, as the matter. Does that make any sense? It's not before the show starts, it's during, right? He was using props on stage during the play to measure the play instead of using rulers and protractors backstage to measure not only the events on stage, but at the events backstage and in the audience and in the, in the house and, yeah, and in the world. He just chose one set of rulers and protractors and then he said that the stuff in the universe is engaged in one equation called the Einstein field equations with that stuff. Okay. You've got rulers and protractors. Right. Rulers and protractors mean something. These are tools for unpacking a system. The system is the universe. And my sense is that you play some kind of a game. And the game is like how many categories and tools do I need before there's no residual that I can't explain about the observed, right? That's how I know when the, the game is over, right? I'm sorry. I, I just back a little bit again. This is engaged in one equation called the Einstein field equations with that stuff. Okay. You've got rulers and protractors, right? Rulers and protractors mean something. These are tools. Actually, let's go back to what he said. That's worth revisiting a little bit. Eric saying that. So in other words, he didn't allow the stuff in the universe to dance on top of the rulers and protractors. He just chose one set of rulers and protractors. And then he said that the stuff in the universe is engaged in one equation called the Einstein field equations with that stuff. That's tough. He didn't, mm, one more time. Stuff in the universe to dance on. He didn't allow the stuff in the universe, let's say matter, let's say like me, a desk, the sun, to dance on the rulers and protractors. And by that, I think he means the, the set of all possible rulers and protractors, but he didn't say that. On top of the rulers and protractors, he just chose one set of rulers and in st so he didn't allow the stuff of the universe to dance on the rulers and protractors. Instead, protractors. he picked one set of rulers and protractors. And then he said that the stuff in the universe is engaged in one equation called the Einstein. And the stuff in the universe is engaged in one way with those rulers and protractors. Field equations with that stuff. Okay. You've so he picked one ruler set, one, one rule set, rulers and protractors and that the stuff of the universe is engaged with that, with those rulers and protractors in one way, the equations. And I think Eric's arguing that let the stuff dance on the field of all possibles, and then the question we ask is the 3-1 manifold of space-time, is 4D reality, is the universe. He's mistaking our particular VR headset for the entirety of the system. And by he, I mean Einstein, I think is what he's saying. You've got rulers and protractors. Right. Rulers and protractors mean something. These are tools for unpacking a system. The system is the universe. And my sense is that you play some kind of a game. And the game is like how many categories and tools do I need 
before, there's no residual that I can't explain about the observed, right? That's how I know when the, the game is over, right? That's how I know when this is a... Well, th actually, to be blunt about it, the really weird thing about my theory is, you know, you're what, 30 trillion cells, 60 trillion cells? You know, the number keeps changing. I would say the current estimates, it should be such an easy calculation. I know. But 30 trillion is the so one I hear currently. 30 trillion, yep. Okay. How did that result in, in what, 250 adult cell types estimated? As, as far as we know. As far as we know. Okay. That all started from a single fertilized egg, which is, I mean, it doesn't get better than this. No, okay. that's a miracle. So how does that thing have the information, largely, to become you? Well, it didn't, that's a process of unpacking the consequences of a very simple seeming initial object. I have an, an innocuous fertilized egg. What, what could it possibly become? Nobody would ever guess that it would become you. Right. From first principles. Right. So that was part of what I was trying to do with, uh, with the theory of everything. Is like, is there anything that unpacks into something that has the richness of our world? Is there anything with almost no evident structure whose consequence is us, because there's tons of evidence structure. Okay, that's beautiful. I've never heard you say that before, but it dovetails exactly. Okay, so in this case, for yep. example, that simple hairband where you shrink the radius of that little tube down to an infinitesimal amount, yep. generates... Wait. ...would become you. Right. From first principles. Right. So that was part of what I was trying to do with uh, with the theory of everything. is like, is there anything that unpacks into something that has the richness of our world? Is there anything with almost no evident structure whose consequence is us? Because there's tons of evident structure. Okay, that's beautiful. I've never heard you say that before, but it dovetails exactly. Okay, so in this case, for yeah. example, that simple hairband where you shrink the radius of that little tube down to an infinitesimal amount. Yeah generate so so he is not concerned with the three-dimensional like it is a like a, a tube like a hose that got you know the head and the tail stuck together and now it's a little hairband instead it's like shrink that three-dimensionality down to two okay it's a paper towel core that falls into two pieces turning that into the analog of space-time is wrapping that hairband in some way around the towel core so that it goes around once. Wait, wait, wait. You've lost me. The towel core, I thought, <laughs> yeah. is Was the, the space extension? of all rulers that could go at any point. So just move the bit of the hairband up so to the... So if you put the hairband on the towel right. roll, then you, can, you could mark every space, and then you could move it up and down, and that would tell you which rulers and you could move using. it up over here and down over there, so it's got a big ruler at this point, oh, okay. a small. Cool. But it, the idea is that each point on the hairband only goes through one ruler, which is represented as a, the, the space of possible each, rulers. Each point on the band intersects exactly one point on the tube. One point uh, of the longitudinal lines on the tube. How, 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 how? So I thought I understood what he was talking about. Maybe, maybe this one is not doable. I thought that's what he was saying there in a second ago, but so the paper, the the there are all these longitudinal thingies, and the hairband can only cross one of these. You could move it up over here and down over there, so it's got a big ruler at this point, oh, okay. a small. Cool. But it, the idea is that each point on the hairband only goes through one ruler, which is represented as a. The, the space of possible each, rulers. Each point on the band intersects exactly one point on the tube. One point uh, of the longitudinal lines on the tube. So, but, the, but he said longitudinal, so longitudinal would be this way. But if I do this, it's intersecting lots of them. And if I do this, I guess it's intersecting only one, theoretically. Okay. Every point in the hairband only goes through one line 
along the lengthwise direction of the tube. Yeah. But wasn't he just describing something that would look like that? So that it's how much it travels here would be short and how much it travels here would be long. But that would be diagonal, in which case there would be many points at which it connects. Okay. Right. So that's a choice. Although, I'm, I mean, I don't know. I'm just misunderstanding this. Probably. <laughs> of a particular ruler. The line along that tube is the choice of all possible rulers. So you can... Whoa, what? Space of possible each, rulers. Each point on the band intersects exactly one point on the tube. One point uh, of the longitudinal lines on the tube. Each point on the band. So not that the band can't hit multiples of these longitudinal lines, but that each point only hits one. So then you could do this. Or this. You know? Or this. Because each point... Uh, mm. No, no, no. It would have to still get to the end, I guess, right? So... Yeah, okay. So, like, yeah, like, this point isn't going to hit this guy. It's just going to stay... Okay, okay. Every point in the hairband only the goes through one line along the lengthwise direction of the tube. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's a choice of a particular ruler. And when it crosses, then that ruler is chosen. And then at this point, that ruler has been chosen. And at this point, that ruler, and blah, blah, blah. The line along that tube is the choice of all possible rulers. So, When he says line, does he mean like this, the hairband line? Or does he mean the line along the tube being like these? Or he just means like the fact that it's extruded in this direction? You can order any ruler you want from Amazon. We'll customize it. Yep. Okay, I want this ruler for this point, this ruler for that point. Okay. And so as, the, like, say the hairband does that. So I want this ruler at this point. I want this ruler at this point. I want this ruler at this point. I want this. It's behind, so I'm going to do dots. I want that ruler for that point. I want that ruler for that point. I think I get it. Okay. Now imagine that you had physics that was happening not on the hairband, but on the tube. And which, like... You could ask for the temperature gradient across the tube. Maybe part of the tube is warm, part of the tube is cold. And the only thing you're going to record is what the temperature was like at that point on the tube. The, that the instantaneous hairband, measure. At that point that the hairband was around the tube. Yep. That is effectively the new use of the space-time metric. We knew about rulers, and we knew about protractors, but we don't have a model in which that is a periscope importing information from the tube back to the hairband. So the game then is what is... I want to hear that last part again. At that point that the hairband was around the tube. Yep. That is effectively the new use of the space-time metric. We knew about rulers, and we knew about protractors, but we don't have a model in which that is a periscope importing information from the tube back to the hairband. So metric we're using is a periscope from the 14D down to, I don't know if down's the right word, but down to the 3-1 ma manifold. The 3-1 metric. The rulers and protractors are sampling the 14-dimensional manifold. Okay. The game, then, is what is the minimally complex geometric structure that provides you enough richness that you can get to all of the states you need with a simple description of... Sort of. Let me just test to see whether or not I understood you. In yeah. my case, what I would say is that the hairband has enough data. So the hairband is like the, the fertilized egg. Yeah. It has enough data to build the tube, which is... Tell me about the space of all rulers I could have at every point on the hairband. Yeah. Right? Just like he was saying before with the circle, Any point, if you're on the circle and you understand the idea that you could measure all tangents at all places in all ways 
for any point, then from there you could figure out, oh, I'm in a circle. And in the same sense, he's saying the hairband that's like, say, around there, the hairband is able to move this way and that, you know, it could be up here, it could be up here. It could go crazy and go like that, you know. I think I think that's allowed in this scenario. I don't know, um, but it could do any version of its uh, positioning, which would eventually allow somebody on the hairband to go, "Oh, I'm living on a paper towel core," because that is what it looks like when you coalesce or combine all of the possible hairband states into one, you get this structure of a paper towel core. Measuring the tangent directions. Then on the hairband, now that the hairband has generated the paper towel core, yeah. now I do physics on the paper towel core, like it can have fields, effectively, yep. stuff. Just like if you were a denizen of, oops, if a denizen of the circle land, you would think of this circle and imagine 2D land and be like, okay, what physics are happening on this circle that influence my life as I'm at different points on this circle or other people or whatever. But the physics happens at this two dimensional level here, even though you experience just kind of like one. Uh, dimension of experience, one location on the line that apparently is a circle in a larger sense. That roam around on the towel core, that are natural for the towel core. And I say, well, can I perceive all of that? No, you can only perceive the part that's along the hairband. So, and then the idea is that we're fooled in my story right. into thinking that the physics is all happening along the hairband which is, in, in our case, the four-dimensional world. But the physics is actually weirdly happening on this 14-dimensional auxiliary structure, which is the analog of the toilet paper or the, the paper towel core. And we're only sampling the part through the periscope of putting the hairband around at one particular latitude across those lines of longitude. Now, in some <laughs> sense, this is my worst nightmare because I think you're telling me that this is another, this is a better version of many worlds. That the particular hairband that describes an interaction with the tube is like the one world in the many possibilities. Well, if you wanted to go that direction, and I, and oh, many, I don't. Many, word, many worlds is a very particular quantum mechanical concept yeah. due to, I guess, Everett was the popularizer of it. What I would say is, in an observerse, which is the, the structure that contains both the hairband and the paper towel core, yep. I, I analogize that to being like you're going to attend a soccer game or a basketball game, and you have stands and you have the pitch. And so the stands are where you perceive what's going on in the pitch, and the pitch is like the towel core. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Gotta draw base. Well, all right, we could do basketball, I guess. Is this useful, these lines as people? <laughs> yeah, this is my beer. Yeah, this is my beer. This is my beer. Oh, and then there's like a dude up here. 
don't get it. Swoosh. Okay. So he would, he, I think, you know, like this is the pitch and the rest is the stands. But well, oh shit. Whoopsies. Okay. The, the uh, paper towel, air band and the paper towel core. Yep. I, I analogize that to being like you're going to attend a soccer game or a basketball game and you have stands and you have the pitch. And so the stands are where you perceive what's going on in the pitch. And the pitch is like the towel core, the, to the, to the uh, paper towel core, the yep. cardboard. And the stands are like the hairband. Okay, so... Ba -ba -ba -ba. So I just lost it. Like, what? <laughs> which one was which? I think I can, but let's. So the stands are where you perceive what's going on in the pitch, and the pitch is like the towel core. Okay. So like the this is a weird metaphor for me. It doesn't work as well as it, I, it seems to clearly work for Eric, but like the oh, I gotta be on the actual layer. This the pitch is like the the paper towel core. This is like where everything's happening. This is like the sh the big show, and then the let's go with blue. Then the stands out here are where like all the observing is happening, and that's that's like the the hairband. So the let's let's he's blue because he's a hairband man, and then the and all of them are let's. Here, I'll do oh, everybody. That guy's sitting in the stands over there. He's just far away. That's why he's small. But he's got courtside seats. So the these guys, I guess the whole thing is, looks like a paper towel core, huh? So like the game, it's weird because it actually changes the foreground background thing for me because I always think when he talks about the observers, like the paper towel core is the meta structure and the, the hairband itself is sort of like the observable space like the manifest 3d 40 world that is a small sampling of the total of the 14 dimensional thing and in this it's kind of like i i always picture the stands in a in a baseball stadium or a football stadium or during a basketball game like they're always kind of larger and surrounding the game usually not always with a baseball game, but almost always, right? Like there's sort of this, this thing that circles the rest of it. So the metaphor kind of breaks for me a little bit because it feels like it's the opposite of what it should be. But I get it. I get it. So he's saying that the game is the paper towel core and the people in the stands are the, are the hairband because the people in the stands, any one person in the stands, like just, let me go back to blue here, just this guy is going to see just one version of events. And it's going to be a bit different from this guy here who's going to see like all kinds of stuff, especially with how close he is. He's going to see all kinds of different stuff. And they're both going to see different stuff from this guy who's over here. So like the fact that their perspectives are unique and distributed and different is kind of like their one observation that takes place uh, it, it's like an observation of this game in the pitch. So it's kind of like the entirety of the game's happening in the pitch and the hairbands are sampling a particular slice, a particular version of events. And not version exactly, because it's like a particular amount of information about the total game, right? Because like this dude over here might see some you know, foul that happens right here, but this dude might completely miss it because there was a guy in front of him. A guy in the stands or a player or whatever, and he'll be like, there was no foul. But this guy's like, absolutely there was a foul. And if you think about it, you're like, oh, there's a paradox. It's another triangle with 90, 90, 90. And it's like, no, it's because this guy is sampling just this part, and this guy is sampling just this part, and this guy's sampling just this part. 
but they all feel like they have the whole thing. They're all the guys struggling with the elephant, thinking that reality is, you know, like a trunk, like skin, like a flappy ear, like a tail, when they're all grasping at pieces. But the totality happens on the paper towel core, the 14-dimensional structure, which is the entirety of the game. Now, strictly speaking, he would also say the obsiverse is not just the pitch, it also encompasses the stands. So the obsiverse, as Eric's talking about, is everything. But I do think there are two distinct pieces that are very interrelated. But, yeah. The, to the, to the uh, paper towel core, the yeah. cardboard, and the stands are like the hairband. And so you're only sampling some of what's going on from every particular... But I think, too, the hairbands out in the audience, the, the three-dimensional world, the impression I get is that our three-dimensional world in tot totality, in its totality, is analogous to one of the guys in the stand. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe he means that, like, different measurements, different things are analogous to different observers in the same stadium looking at the same game from different directions. But I think the entirety of our three our four-dimensional world, our space-time, is analogous to one of these observations in the stands, not multiple. Or, like, they're multiple over time. Like, at this, you know, point in time, it's this guy, and, it, you know, at this unit time, it's this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. So, like, so the, the hairband moves along the paper towel core in different ways and in different whatevers, but, but it's one observation of the game at any given time but that observation changes because the hairband moves, I think. Like, you and I went to the same game, yeah. but we saw different things because you were seated sure. on the floor and I'm up in the bleachers. Right, but so are there multiple ha hairbands running at the same time in our four-dimensional reality? Or, or each person, or this is an attempt to explain how a hairband's observation could be different at one point than another and the hairband can move or be different people in the metaphor. That I get. The, the part of the many worlds thing that drives me well, insane just, that me, I want to make sure isn't lurking here. I mean, and if it well, is... Well, I'm just trying to say that I don't see many universes. I see one observerse. And the one observerse is a more complicated or more rich structure. I don't want to say, because I don't think it's that difficult to understand. Yeah. In which... You would be confused if you thought, like, I'm the only person that exists and I happen to be sitting here in the stands and you saw that guy get pushed across the way. I said, I didn't see him get pushed. It was like, you have a different view of the action. You saw things I never saw. There was more going on than I could perceive in my seat. I get that and that, I like that, you know. The game took place. There was one reality of the game and there were an infinite number of possible edits based on where you were. There were an infinite number of places you could I like what from. you just said. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, that's what happened in the first Matrix movie that they actually mocked it up in 3D and then they only took one of the possible camera angles for the CGI scenes. Hmm. I didn't know that. That's only kind of true. They were looking to, at the time in 98, 99, to figure out a way to f more or less freeze or extremely slow the objects on camera, but have the speed of the camera's movement be independent. And usually slow motion, right, is increase the frame rate of the camera, but then that increases, or that you still have to physically move the camera. So that how fast you move the camera determines how fast the camera moves. So it changes both the, the subject in the frames movement as well as the camera move they were looking to some way to separate time and space visually so what they did was they figured out how to take the actors put them in the configurations they needed like agent smith and neo jumping at each other with guns and the camera circles around them they would have needed like a camera on a on a rocket to move as fast as they needed for the camera move to be the right speed so what they did instead was they figured out in like conceptually and maybe they modeled it up in previs type stuff or something like block uh, uh, computer animated stuff but they they figured out okay how many frames in an animation sense how many frames of image would you need to approximate the feeling of that camera move going the right smooth direction and speed but also have the actors going that super slow-mo simultaneously they figured out what that was and then they positioned stationary cameras around around the the path of the camera the path of the virtual camera and then they shot single sequential through time 
they they put him on a green screen, slammed Keanu Reeves and Hugo Weaving together, and shot the still cameras, and then they had the computer interpolate and create the in-betweens so that they could get quite the right smoothness and the right speed of the camera move with the actor's movements. It may, it's basically what he said, kind of. But it's they didn't like mock up the whole thing in 3D and then just choose one exactly, They which is more similar to what he's trying to explain with his model. It was more like... I mean, it's kind of like that, I guess. Conceptually, they figured out what it would need to happen with the camera versus the actors, and then they figured out a real-world way to achieve that frame rate and movement independent of the actor's movement. And then they showed you that in the film. I'm just saying. Yeah. So the question, though, is, will your hypothesis in my world, theory in your world, will it rescue us from the idea that all of these things are happening, that every game took place? Let's fix the geometry underneath both general relativity. This is great. What I'm, what I'm hoping, yes. my prediction, is that if you do that, if you fix the geometry, then many worlds goes away. Well, because in part, what you're calling a world yeah. may be a, perfect, a particular way of placing the hairband around the core. And yes, there are an infinite number of ways yes. of placing the hairband around the paper towel core. All right. So... We should probably figure out how to close this up. Obviously, <laughs> my sense is that what you have described is a So an infinite number of places in the stadium you can sit to watch the game. Yeah. And, the, and, and what you'll observe from different seats will be different. And that might explain why you would get, like in, in a Many Worlds formulation, you'd get like, oh, but that, like Many Worlds is insane because if I sit here... I, I observe something happening, and if I sit here, I observe something else happening, and, and like those two things can't happen simultaneously. And it's like, well, but maybe you're missing the fact that like this, your vision is blocked over here, and this person's seeing beyond that physical barrier, or you know, you're seeing information that they don't have, but it seems like it would be impossible for anyone to have. But you're wrong about that. Like, so there are an in, quasi infinite number of seats in the stadium to sit in to look at the game. And maybe each of those seats correlates to each um, world in many worlds. Oh, the colors seemed great. And now I'm like back to super yellow. <laughs> it's like the sun is in my face. Exactly what I was hoping you would do, which is the sort of intuitive version of what it is that you do and what the sort of thing is that you think you found. And then there's, a, there's probably 20 chalkboards full of math that mirrors what you're saying and in his lecture that he did that I, you know, I'll, pro I'll link to the video, the lecture he did, where he did put a bunch of math on the, on the board and stuff. And the added value for most of us for the math on the board is probably zero or near zero. Mostly because we're not physicists or mathematicians, sure. <laughs> right, the point is, if the math is right, then what you have just described is likely to be true, and that that would resolve many of the things that cause us to get... Well, look, uh what I'm, if you want it at that level, what I would say is, Einstein told us take four degrees of freedom, put four rulers and six protractors on top of them, which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space time, and space time generates curvature, and curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. Oof. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's follow with them. I was going to get my previous picture, but then what you have just described is likely to be true, and that that would resolve many of the things that cause us to get. Well, look. Uh, what I'm, if you want it at that level, what I would say is, Einstein told us take four degrees of freedom, put four rulers and four degrees of freedom. Boop, boop. X, Y, Z. Let's put some rulers on each of these. I'll put the ruler for Z out here. And we're going to do time then in that direction. It's T. Again, it's a clock because it's different. Six protractors on. So then six angles. Top of them, which is the right number. Yeah. <laughs> which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space time, and space time generates. So 
all of this is space time. Curvature and curvature is space time existing. Having length and angle gives you curvature. Equals curve. Curvature. Measured by the stuff floating around in the system. Curvature is measured by the stuff floating in the system? Which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space time, and space time generates curvature. Generates curvature. It's not exactly equal to curvature. Space time. Whoop. Space time generates curvature. And curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. Curvature is measured by the stuff floating in the system. Curve measured by the stuff floating in system. So it's measured by like the matter instead, the, the things in the system. So you set the stuff floating around in the system, the matter and the energy equal to the amount of curvature that comes. Oh! Curvature is measured by the stuff floating in the system. So you cancel that craziness out by adding, mm, I had it, I had it for a second there. Let's roll it back a little. Curvature and curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. So you set the stuff floating around in the system, the matter and the energy equal to the amount of curvature. So you, stu so you set the stuff, set stuff in system. equal to the curvature? Is that what he said? That comes out of the rulers and protractors. The end freedom put four rulers and six protractors on top of them, which is the right number. Yeah. Call that space time and space time generates curvature and curvature is measured by the stuff floating around in the system. So you set the stuff floating around in the system, the matter and the energy equal to the amount of curvature that comes out of the rulers and protractors and you're done. Yeah. Huh. If you like, the augment. So if you do that, you set the stuff in the system equal to the curvature that naturally comes out of the line, the, the length and angle measurements, then you get like, you've canceled out the curvature, right? Like now you've got, you're back to a simplified plane where like everything's equalized out and now you can do equations without having to like adapt to the deformed curvature of something some realm of space or whatever notation here is not so fast shoot that was all like einstein's formulation what if the fields that is the stuff the matter and the energy the bosons and the fermions are dancing across all possible rulers and all possible protractors and what you're doing is you're sampling the rulers and the protractors on one particular choice, in this case, the hairband around the core, and along that, you're pretending that that is the world, and that's the universe, and that's us, and our fate, and when did the world begin? And in some sense, you're asking, you've learned to ask an entire set of narcissists. Let's go back. So he's saying, hold up, what if this stuff in the system is dancing on the set of all possible rulers and protractors. And again, the set of all rulers and protractors is synonymous with the vapor tile core. The 14 dimensional manifold, I think. I think it's a manifold, I'm not sure. The matter and the energy, the bosons and the fermions, are dancing across all possible rulers and all possible protractors. And what you're doing is you're sampling the rule. What if the matter and energy is dancing all over the place on the taper towel core and what you're doing rulers and the protractors on one particular is pudding pudding what if the fields that is the stuff the matter and the energy the bosons and the fermions are dancing 
across all possible rulers and all possible protractors. And what you're doing is you're sampling the rulers and the protractors on one particular choice, in this case the hairband around the core, and along that, you're pretending that that is the world. And that's the... You sample a particular point in time or like, you know, hairband location, but you're pretending and deluding yourself that the hairband sample is the entirety of the world. That your what you observed from your seat is the only data in the game. When that's not true, the game is much more expansive than your perspective of the game. The paper towel core is much larger than just your sampling via the hair, the hair tie, the hairband. Universe, and that's us and our fate. And when did the world begin? And in some sense, you're asking, you've learned to ask an entire set of narcissistic questions based on your particular perception of the observers. And the observers is about the pitch and the stands being part of the stadium. If you learn to stop asking questions about your experience of the game, and you ask, well, what game took place yesterday? How many people, how many different things did they see, and what took place on the pitch, independent of what I was able to perceive as taking place at my seat? You know? Mm -hmm. Then you, you start to understand. What all happened in the game, independent of my particular viewpoint of it, yeah. Like, nobody would talk about the many games hypothesis where every single person experienced a different game last night, you know? And then there are ways in which the stands interact with the pitch because everybody's yelling, like, miss, miss, during a free throw, right? Which does inform the playing of the game, which is a little distinct from the observer's experience of the game. So the, sam the type of sampling you do could affect the paper towel core. Right? The kinds of questions you ask and how you formulate them could affect the type, the how of your sampling could affect the thing sampled. Huh. Yeah, and so you also have to deal with the fact that there's a way, way in which people who aren't supposed to be part of the game become part of the game. No, I love this. That Like the, the guy in the stands talking trash to the players, yeah. So the way in which you, the way in which you observe, the way in which you sample, the way in which you are hairband and circles the paper towel tube could affect the entirety of the 14 dimensional observers both the the, the observer and the or the, the the sampling the sampler and the tube right like the the game and the audience member or the you know the fan in the stands the indefinitely large number of different observations of the game do not imply more than one game. There's a lot more game than physics currently thinks is going on. That's my belief. All right. Right. All right. This is. Oh, oh let's get that out of there. <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and maybe set this. Let's kill that maybe. Um, for the moment, I think the thing... Nope, nope, we're not starting that over, jeez. So, just keep that in the back at the bottom. So, that not, because there, just because there are many ways of perceiving the game does not mean that there were a, a, an infinite number of different games in their entirety that occurred. That, like Eric said, that there are there's a much bigger game being played. That the system that encompasses the game on the field, the audience in the stands, the stadium itself, and the interaction of all of these elements upon and with each other, that that is the entirety that we should be taking into account when we think of like source code reality. And that is where the, the fundament, the firmament rather, is. That's where the base is. And that to think that we've got our stuff locked up because we're thinking about how everything works on our hairband, on our sample of the meta structure. That yeah, it's kind of like what he's saying. It's narcissistic. It's you're 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 just you're blinded by your own ways of asking the question, your own ways of looking what you see in your periscope versus the entirety of the space that your periscope can occupy possibly. Whew. 
All right. Well, uh, thanks for sticking with it if you got this far. It's uh, like almost three and plus hours. Um, yeah, I think I got a lot out of this, actually, doing it again. Um, I honestly, I, I don't know. I could probably do it again. Uh, I might do another one of these um, about his, on April Fool's or April 2nd, when he released his sort of video talking more about Geometric Unity and more of his, like, uh, some of the details. I, if I remember right, it has, because I've only seen that one once, I think it has a lot more math. I feel like, and I'm not a mathematician, um, but if I, I feel like if it'll be any use, then maybe cool. Um, if you honestly got anything out of this, feel free to comment. It'll actually tell me if it's uh, worthwhile doing this again for the other video and putting it up. Um, and yeah, and if you'd like to see the whiteboard, I, now that I went through that again, I don't know if I'll do a whiteboard video because this is so many disparate elements trying to get in on a center core of truth that I... Ooh, I might be able to do something, but I was hoping to do it like with Eric's audio, but now I'm thinking the sequencing and everything, it wouldn't quite work unless he unless he talked about it at length again and somewhere else. Um, and maybe that's the video. Maybe that's the other uh, the, the other Geometric Unity in April video he did. I'll, I'll put that video in the description too. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to see a whiteboard video that tries to condense this down into a sensible sensical structure and hope and probably a lot of metaphor uh feel free to say that in the comments and uh and if you dug this cool thank you very much uh like subscribe that'd be dope um and thanks thanks for hanging out peace